This story takes place in August of 2013, in the mountains of Southern Oregon. I am a U.S. Air Force Security Forces Airman, military policeman. My girlfriend was at work, and as a swelteringly hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick, another military cop, and I decided to go explore some back roads and get out of the heat in town. Southern Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads some actively used, and many totally forgotten and overgrown. Nick and I spent many of our days off starting on roads that we knew, finding roads we didn't know, driving for hours into the mountains, and eventually navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road that we'd never been on, and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for around an hour, we hadn't seen or heard any signs of other people in the woods. We rounded a bend in a thick fir woods and emerged in a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noise, no squirrels and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange and was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the aspen grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see very far into the trees, as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out of the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about 5 foot 5, but regardless, the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would have had to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck, and I noticed that he was looking back into the aspens. At first I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of color that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small one-man tent was set back in the trees, about 50 feet from the strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread, and felt certain that there was someone in that tent, and that if we could see the tent, they could see us. There were no campgrounds in this area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely somebody camping so remotely would be, at the very least, a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we didn't see any movement or hear any sounds coming out of it. Nick suggested that I call out. I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? I yelled. No reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area. But then we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in the tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? What if somebody really needed help and we were just going to walk away? Foolish, I know, but we thought it all the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the camp should we need to leave in a hurry. He would be waiting behind the wheel. With my heart pounding, I started walking through the trees toward the tent. I was totally keyed up with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, if you can call it that, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built. No wood collected. The tent was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. 
full of dread, I turned to leave to tell Nick what I had seen. But as soon as I left, I heard Nick start yelling, Let's go! Let's go! Get the F out of here! Come on, let's go! Not knowing why he was yelling, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat-up old Ford Taurus on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat, and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men. A third person was laying against the window in the back. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated out the way we'd come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I still don't know if the person in the back was male or female. I called the state police and they promised to send a trooper out to check the scene. However, I received a call the next day from a trooper stating that the campsite, the backpacks, the women's clothing, and the tent were all gone. He could tell that people had been in the area, though. They did mention that the strange table was still by the thick aspen grove. I have not returned to the area, and I don't intend to. I've only shared this experience with a few people in the years since it happened. It was the first Tuesday of the Pennsylvania deer season, December 3rd, 2013. I've always been an avid hunter, and I would wake up very early in the morning to get into the woods before daylight. I would be in the woods at 4.30 in the morning. Having to hunt on state game lands meant beating other people into the woods to get a decent spot. When I got to the parking area at about 4.15, nobody else was there. So, I walked into the woods, not using a flashlight, just walking by moonlight. I walked through a field into the tree line and started on the path to my spot. I came to the intersection in the path. One way went left and down the mountain. The other way went right. I went right because my spot was on the other side. Roughly 50 yards after making the right-hand turn, I smelled what I could only describe as hot garbage. It hit me in the face. Like, I mean hot dumpster juice in the middle of August. So I stopped dead, turned on my flashlight, expecting to see piles of garbage, but nothing. No garbage, nothing dead, just that hot garbage smell. Keep in mind this is in December, it's cold out, high 20s to low 30s. So even if there was garbage, it shouldn't smell that bad. So I kind of thought nothing of it. I followed the path to my spot, which was down over the ridge from the garbage smell, roughly 40 feet down. That leads into a grass field where I would sit. I set up my seat, got settled in for about two minutes. And that's when the rocks started coming down the ridge. The first rock startled me, causing me to turn on my light again scanning the field hoping to see eye reflection of a deer, but nothing was there. I sat back down. Another rock comes down the ridge. This time I stand up to go into the grass field with a flashlight and the pistol that I carry while hunting. I scanned again. Nothing. I purposefully waited in that field for about five minutes. Now I'm getting angry, assuming that another hunter is messing with me because I'm in their spot. I sit down again. The third rock, sounding larger than the others, comes tumbling down the ridge. I don't get up this time. Not two minutes after that, another rock, not tumbled, but sounded as though it was thrown off the ridge and landed in the field. Now I'm pissed. I gathered up my gear and started back up to the trail, to the ridge. I get on top of the ridge, scanning with my light the whole time. Nothing. No eyes, no other hunter. I get to the spot where I had smelled the hot garbage. Nothing, including the smell. It's just gone. 
Finally, it all clicked in my head. It may not have been another person. It might have been something else. I've heard stories of people's Bigfoot experiences, a lot of which remark about how bad they smell and about rocks being thrown. I thought, screw this. I all but ran out of the woods, and to top it off, no other vehicles were in the parking area when I got out of the woods. This took place in Pennsylvania State Game Lands 229, outside of Tremont, in Schuylkill County. I later came to find out that a co-worker of mine had actually seen a bipedal cross in front of his car within two miles of the location of my experience. So maybe they're real. I don't know. But I definitely had an experience that I won't soon forget. My girlfriend and I went on a three-day backpacking trip in the Monongahela National Forest. It was day two of the trip, and we were coming back toward the trailhead on the return loop. We were crossing a relatively clear dell when I see a large, dark brown object move from directly in front of me into a small thicket of pines off to the left. At about 30 yards, it went from 12 o'clock to 10 o'clock in my field of vision in about one second. Extremely quick, despite it being large and making no sound whatsoever. I could clearly make out the shape of a head, leading shoulder, and arm, running like a human would that was trying to stay low. I freeze in my tracks and look for a second, and then I explain to Susie what I had seen. She was watching her footing and hadn't seen it at all. We watched and waited for a few minutes, then for a few minutes discussed what it could have been. We decided the only thing that size and color could be a bear. I jokingly laughed it off as a Bigfoot sighting. Took a picture of the spot, marked the GPS coordinates, and we continued. As the day went on, the more I realized that it could not have been a bear. What I saw moved too fast to have been one, and I clearly saw horizontal shoulders which meant that this thing was walking upright, if hunched over, and that the only way to cross that area without making a sound would have been by stepping nimbly from stone to stone. We finished the trip without giving it a whole lot more thought. I got home tonight and I was telling this story to some friends in a group chat. I shared a picture that we had taken of the spot so I could explain how it moved. I hadn't looked at the picture before, but one friend spots a face peering out from behind a tree. And sure enough, it was in the exact spot where I saw the mystery creature run to. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by. We were like two peas in a pod. We were both adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just being outside. She was born in Alaska and her dad had lived there for quite a while, so they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. It was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing and did a lot of camping. This happened during the mid to late 90s and we were maybe around 10 to 12 years old. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly. One camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow, and feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. Anyway, we played in the meadow and the stream all day while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't very big, and because it had a meadow all around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me weird vibes can't explain it. I just felt really uneasy. Anyway, the day faded away into early evening and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad picked up his fishing gear and we all walked back to the truck on this long winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up this steep road that was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced that my friend's dad was going to break his truck. 
He had a four, maybe six cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even sure if the truck had four wheel drive, but being an Alaskan outdoorsman with years of experience, I trusted him. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open, with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road we drove up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up, and my friend and I decided to go explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in that direction, but didn't see anything. Thinking it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we were walking, we heard it again and whispered to one another about what it could be, but kept going. It stopped briefly, and when we were about 200 yards from our camp, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep, wooded hill, overlooking the dirt road from where we'd come. Suddenly, we heard another cracking branch from behind. Whatever it was, seemed to be following us. Our imaginations going wild, we came up with everything from a serial killer stalking us in the woods, to deer, to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that her dad had gotten out his pistol and would be sleeping with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent, and he was in his own tent not far from us, so we figured everything would be okay. I awoke sometime in the middle of the night to hear something, or someone, walking outside. As I lay still, listening, I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs, because it had a distinct rhythm in how it walked. Whatever it was, it sounded big. I could hear its weight, if that makes any sense, as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet, but deep, heavy breathing at times. As I lay there listening, I could hear it wandering to the other parts of the campsite, and then back to our tent, almost as if it was walking in a big, repetitive loop. This went on for who knows how long, it felt like an eternity. Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I lay there and listened until somehow I eventually fell asleep. The next morning I told my friend and her dad about it, but I don't know if they believed me or not. Interestingly, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. The ground was not very soft, and in some places was covered in grass, so there were no footprints either. This is something that I have never been able to explain, and to this day, lingers in the back of my mind whenever I camp. I will always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. My grandparents, along with my grandma's sister and her husband, would go to Ontario, Canada every year for a fishing vacation. The area in Ontario is about 200 miles north of International Falls, Minnesota. During these vacations, they would go park by the garbage dump at dusk and watch the bears come out. Sadly, the local bear population had been reduced to eating garbage due to the presence of humans. Being from the south side of Chicago, it was fun and interesting for my grandparents, particularly my grandma. One evening, my grandma and my Aunt Beth were parked on the rim of the dump and sitting in Beth's car looking down at the bears in the dump below. While my grandma sees one bear on his hind legs, he turns and makes eye contact with her. To her dismay, she realized that this was not a bear. It was Bigfoot. He looked at me with such evil in his eyes, she said. She screamed at Beth to start the car and to get out of there. Beth, hearing the tone of my grandma's voice, did what she said without asking any questions until they were a safe distance away. After they got out of there, Beth pulled over and my grandma told her what she saw. 
My grandma passed away in 1993. She was a wonderful person and had an open mind to what is now referred to as high strangeness. I think that's where I get my interest in it. I keep hearing howls and human-like whoops near the area where I'm camping in Utah. There's a lot of strange activity, such as strange smells around the tents, like a dirty wild animal, noises, and even items being thrown and damaged. I am convinced that it is not a bear, and so are my friends. But we're unsure as to what to do since the activity seems to be more frequent and sort of aggressive. The dogs act up by barking and whimpering on certain nights, as if there were a larger animal nearby. There's also the occasional feeling that we're being watched during the night, and some of us have had rocks thrown at us while walking out down between the two hills. These two hills kind of make a small canyon by a gorge. We have flattened the soil where we think it is at night, hoping to get tracks, but so far we've gotten nothing. We have read about bears, but we have come to the conclusion that this is not a bear. It could be nothing, but I am certain that something is not right about whatever is stalking us. One of my friends just reported that while collecting dry firewood, he saw a large ape with shaggy red-brown fur standing at a good eight feet tall. He said it was far up a hill, kind of crouched, observing him from above. Yeah, we're pretty sure it's not a bear. I grew up in Oregon. As most Oregonians do, we did a lot of camping. One particular trip, we were down at our favorite site on the east side of Hills Creek Reservoir. I don't remember the exact date, but I was probably 14 to 15 years old, around 1999. My tent was fairly close to the water, maybe 40 feet back, while my parents' tent with my younger siblings was about 200 feet farther back into the woods. I was maybe 15 feet from the fire, and our kitchen was set up at about 30 feet west of me on a raised area. Everyone went to bed while I stayed up around an hour longer with my dog. We eventually went to bed and I got all cozy. Suddenly my dog perks up, on alert. I wasn't too worried, as I could still hear the frogs and the crickets. Then, everything went dead silent. The frogs and the crickets both stopped. I could hear something coming through the woods from the direction of the lake. It sounded large. I thought maybe a bear or a big deer. My dog starts growling, and I do my best to keep her quiet. The walking sound gets to the raised area of the camp where our kitchen is. I hear some of the stuff move around. I manage to slowly unzip part of the tent window. It's very dark, not much of a moon, and the fire was dying. But I could vaguely see something. Then, a very large figure steps down from the raised area, about a four to five foot drop, and walks directly toward my tent. My heart is pounding. My dog starts shaking while growling, but thankfully, my dog doesn't bark. The figure moves past my tent within five to six feet and makes its way up the road back through the woods with huge, broad steps each, sounding a deep thump. About ten minutes later, the frogs and the crickets come back. I'm nearly a hundred percent sure that I saw Bigfoot. At the time that this happened, I didn't really know what was going on. I just had the impression that the woods outside of my house were very creepy. I only recently decided that I think it was a Bigfoot after doing a lot of research and seeing a lot of similarities between my own story and other people's stories who have had encounters. My family started building a house in rural South Georgia when I was 12, 
and we moved in once it was finished a few months after I turned 13. It was a few miles outside of the town we lived in, a plantation town on the Florida-Georgia border. We lived there until I graduated from high school in 2013. The first thing I don't actually remember happening, but my dad told me about it a few months ago. Apparently the first night my family slept in the new house, when none of the windows had curtains or blinds yet, I came into my parents' bedroom and asked to sleep with them. I did this a lot as a little kid, but it was pretty unusual by the time I was 13. My dad said that I told him I saw a face looking into my window, and that it scared me. The rest of all of this I remember pretty clearly. One time, my sister and I were jumping on a trampoline in our backyard, and all of a sudden we heard something whistle at us. It came from the side of the house, near our garage. I can't explain exactly why it was so terrifying, but it scared us to death. We jumped off the trampoline and sprinted inside, slamming the door behind us. It was just so weird, because we had already met the neighbors at that point, and we didn't have many, and it didn't make sense that they would hide from us and whistle. They would have just walked up to us. Plus, we hadn't seen any people approaching. My sister has told me that she saw something hiding behind the trash can next to the house, but I didn't see that. She doesn't remember the whistling part, but I swear I'll never forget it. It was just so bizarre. I think that she might have seen something and remembered what she saw, while I only remembered what I heard. Sometimes I think that I remember seeing a dog or something run to the side of the house from the woods like super fast, but I don't know for sure if that actually happened. Anyway, that was one of the single freakiest things that has ever happened to me. I know it sounds mundane, but in the moment it was bone chilling, and I still get chills thinking about it. Anyway, after that my dad decided to build a privacy fence around our backyard, and we got two dogs a little bit after that. The yard was pretty big, and my sister and I were both pretty athletic. We would put on headphones and play in the yard while we listened to music, kick a soccer ball, run laps around the yard, play fetch with the dogs, things like that. Sometimes we did this with each other, and sometimes by ourselves. At night, I always thought I would see some sort of cone-shaped head looking at me over the fence, but if I did a double take to make sure that I wasn't seeing things, the head would be gone. Other times, I'd be out in the yard by myself, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I would feel like I was being watched. This was always scarier to me than when I thought I saw things. I swear it was like I knew that something was watching me, and it was overwhelming. I would stop what I was doing immediately, and go inside. This happened all the time. Other times I'd be shooting basketball in our driveway, or going for a jog through the neighborhood. It was a developing subdivision, not a house out in the woods by itself, and I would get that same freaky feeling. After we got our licenses, I think I actually saw one while I was driving. We were with another friend who also lived outside the city limits, on the way to her house. Our friend was in the front seat, and my sister was in the back seat. We were coming around this bend not too far away from our neighborhood, and all of a sudden my friend and I saw this super tall brown thing on the side of the road. It was very tall, ancient. It looked like a really old man with a long beard and a distorted face. It was slender too, not bulky. My friend and I saw it at the same time, and both said, what was that? I guess my sister was on her phone or something, because I remember that she asked us what we saw, but we'd already passed it by the time she looked out her window. My friend and I both agreed that it was a man in a mask trying to scare people, but I don't think either of us believed that. From then on out, every time I drove past that spot, I would try to see if there were any weird trees or something that we maybe could have thought was a person with a mask, but it just looked like a regular patch of woods. Another time, a different friend was playing with us outside as the sun was setting. 
We were walking down this empty road that no houses had been built on yet, and to our left was some woods with miles and miles of ATV trails. All of a sudden, he just goes, run. We didn't ask questions. We all sprinted back to the house. When we got back, he was shaken up, and he said that he saw something, but he never did tell us what it was. My sister and I are both grown now, and our parents sold the house and moved out of state when we were in college, so we haven't been back for years. But after I did some research and started putting some pieces together, I asked my sister if she thought the house we grew up in was creepy, and she said it absolutely was. She would feel like she was being watched in the yard too, and remembers seeing shadows moving in the woods. She said she'll never forget seeing something hiding behind the trash can that one time. She even independently googled Bigfoot sightings in the town we grew up in, and found an article about a rash of sightings that happened while we were in middle school. Anyway, we both believe that that's why we were so creeped out by the woods outside of our house that there was probably a Bigfoot, maybe more than one, living out there. I never connected all of these weird things until I started listening to Bigfoot podcasts and stuff like that, but now that I've put the pieces together, I feel like I can't unsee it. Today is February 11th of 2020, and I have just had an encounter less than an hour ago. So I'm hanging with my friend. We're going up on top of a mountain, just to go up there. We had no real reason to go up there, we just wanted to. So we get up there and turn the car off. It's completely dead silent. It's really foggy from all the rain that we've been getting, and it just seems to put me and my friend on edge. So we're sitting there with our windows cracked because we were vaping, and all of a sudden, we hear something in the woods, off to our left. He turns down the music, and we both listen. We can see and hear the bushes rustling. First, it would be in one spot, and then ten seconds later it would be in another. My friend opens the door and I grab his wrist and pull him back into the car. I ask him if he's crazy, and he tells me no, he's just curious. I tell him that being curious is what gets people killed in horror movies and I'll be damned if I let you die with me present. He looks at me, disappointed, and then gets back in the car and closes the door. We continue to sit there and listen. We hear the same stuff for about two minutes. And then, it suddenly stops. We both look around and he starts hitting my shoulder with a sense of panic. I go, what do you want? He points to a gravel driveway that leads up to the power lines we were parked under. At the top of the hill, we both see a tall figure standing there, staring us down. I could see the faint red glow in its eyes. I could see my friend's chest rising and falling in the faint light that our phones were emitting. I felt fine, but I could definitely tell that my friend was not. It wasn't until the figure starts walking toward us with an alarming speed that I scream at my friend to snap out of it. He starts the car and hauls ass down the mountain. When we got off the mountain, we both looked at each other, asking each other non-verbally what the heck we just saw. I knew what I saw. I know it was Bigfoot. My friend wasn't so sure. He's not a believer. But after tonight, I feel like our believer community has grown by one. It was Labor Day of 2015. My mother, my wife, my three children, and I all went to a very remote cabin that we rented out. It was an old fire watchman station or something of the sort, so it had the cabin and three other sheds or outbuildings. I'll try to keep it short, but this is a truly bizarre story that I still can't figure out. We unpacked, settled into the cabin, and then decided to walk a couple hundred yards down to the river, barefoot or sandals with shorts for all of us. We got down to the pebbled shore and were playing and throwing rocks when I realized that there were one-foot-long snakes everywhere. 
My wife, mom, and I yanked up the three kids and boogied off. After reaching a safe distance from them, I went back with a water bottle and caught one in it to see what it was. Turns out, we'd been standing in a nest of diamondback rattlesnakes. If one of those things had latched onto one of my kids, they surely would have died. We were about three hours away from any medical facility. We got back to the cabin, and my mom and I went for a walk alone while my wife calmed the kiddos and fed them lunch. Upon returning about 15 minutes later, all three of my kids and my wife were inside with the doors and windows entirely shut up, even though we had opened everything to cool the place off. We went inside to hear all four of them start yelling about a bear that was about 150 yards from the cabin, huffing and puffing at the wife and kids on the front porch and eating. It was down by the river, about 30 yards or so down the hill, when he poked his head up and over. A few hours go by and in that time an ATV passes by three times with two of those inbred looking freaks on it. Each time they stopped in front of the gate onto the property and stared at us or the cabin. Keep in mind, we're two hours into the wilderness in Idaho with not a sight of a person the entire trip except them. We decided it was bedtime for the kiddos because it was pitch black out. Within 10 minutes, our son, who was five at the time, went from being perfectly healthy and active to having a fever of over 103. He was slightly foaming at the mouth, and then eventually became completely unresponsive, all in a very short amount of time. That was it. We were leaving immediately and going to seek medical attention. I opened the front door of the cabin and started loading the two cars by the light of the porch bulb and the headlights on the cars, both of which were parked facing the gate. That's when all three of us adults heard about four to six large and very heavy animals running all around the cabin and the property. There was one on the right side of the house while I was exiting that I could hear pacing back and forth and breathing heavily. I made everybody stay inside and close the door every time I went out to transfer stuff to the cars, which took me about four or five trips. I had a stick and a big pot that I was smacking as hard and as loud as I could on each and every trip, and I was yelling loudly at random. As soon as I was all done loading, I took each kid out individually and loaded them up between the two cars. Then I escorted my mom out, and then my wife. My wife and I were in the lead car, so we pulled up out of the gate. And for some stupid reason, I felt that I just needed to go close the gate. So I got out of my vehicle and walked behind it and my mom's car, about 15 feet, and closed the gate. Now, this gate was literally a log that slides from one post to the other. It offered zero protection between me and the animals out there. Right as I went to turn around, I heard loud padded footsteps walking up to me, directly in front of me, no more than 10 feet. Then I see eyes shimmering from the moonlight as the deepest, scariest growl I've ever heard in my life erupts. I turn and ran so fast I swear I must have jumped from where I was straight into the driver's seat. I slammed it into drive and spun out, finally leaving. Unfortunately, it gets even weirder though. About 15 minutes down the road, we were still panicking about our unresponsive son and we kept having this horrible, evil, doom feeling cast a shadow over us. I looked down and realized I still had that baby rattlesnake in the water bottle in my cup holder. So I grabbed it and threw it out the window immediately. Not even two minutes later, we hear our son softly crying. We realize he's responsive, and he stated something along the lines of, Why are we leaving? What's going on? He was crying because he was so sad to leave. He couldn't even remember the last hour or so. Quick backstory for what's next. My mother was about 58 years old at the time. She's been a Jehovah's Witness my whole life, plus many years before that. And she's the last person in the world to believe in signs, evil spirits, or omens. 
The next day, my mom broke down extremely badly, sobbing her eyes out, hardly able to speak. She confessed to my wife that the night before we left, she had a nightmare in which we went on the camping trip, came across snakes, a bear, and a pack of wolves. She said that she knew a lot of bad things happened at the outpost and that it was full of evil. Most of all, she said, one of your kids died in the dream. I swear on my life to this very day, if I ask her who died and how it happened, she immediately starts crying and refuses to tell me or anyone else. She lives her life now with the guilt that she has willingly ignored her nightmare to put us all in that situation, nearly taking one of her grandkids away from the world. She doesn't deserve to feel like that. It was a nightmare. Anybody would have ignored it. I know this all sounds crazy, but a week later on the news were reports of a wolf pack in the area. Wolves and bears may not usually coexist in harmony, I don't know, but for all I know, they do share territories and respect each other. This outpost station was about an hour and a half into the wilderness from Loman Banks, Idaho, if you want to verify the animals actually exist around there. Sadly, I grew up in the mountains for most of my pre and early teen years, as did my wife until she was 10 years old. I even have a half sleeve of the wilderness and trees on my left arm, but with that said, we don't go into the mountains anymore. Thanks for hearing everything out. I don't really care if you believe me or not. This is a real story, and it's still very visceral for my family and I. That night changed a lot of things for us going forward. I hope someday I can feel comfortable in the mountains again, but as for now, I just don't. Something happened when I was camping 20 years ago, and I can't get it out of my head. I was visiting my uncle and cousin Sarah in rural Pennsylvania. I was about 16, and Sarah was about 12. Sarah asked me if we could go camping, which to her meant pitching a tent at the top of this huge foothill that was on the property. The foothill was very steep and had woods at the top. I'd never been camping before then, but I figured if anything happened, we could just walk back down to the house, so I said, cool, no problem. We pitched the tent so the woods were directly behind it, with the tent opening facing out toward the scenery and the view. We roasted marshmallows, told campfire stories, and got into the tent around 11 p.m. or midnight. Sarah fell asleep right away, but I couldn't, so I was just lying there, counting sheep. Suddenly, I heard leaves shuffling in the woods behind the tent, and I heard footsteps coming out of the woods behind the tent as well. There were a few steps, then it would stop, then a few more. As it got closer, I heard it step on some large rocks. It sounded like a really large hoof step on the rock because it made that clomp sound like a horse does. As it got closer to the tent, I could feel the impact of each step on the ground under me, so whatever it was, was very heavy. At first I thought it was a large buck, and I debated waking my cousin up so she wouldn't miss it. But then, it kept coming closer and closer to the tent. Closer than any deer or buck would have. And suddenly I was overcome with this feeling of full body dread, like something was very, very wrong. Then, I heard a really bizarre sound. It sounded like it was coming from about 8 to 10 feet off the ground. And the best way I can describe it is like someone had a huge roll of masking tape and was pulling off a big section at a time. It was this odd tearing sound, for lack of a better word, and each tearing sound was loud and lasted two to three seconds. I told myself it was a deer and that it was tearing bark off the trees, and that's what was making the noise. But deep down, I knew something was wrong. I didn't want to risk waking Sarah because it would scare her, so I just lay there as quietly as possible praying that whatever it was would leave. But instead of leaving, the tearing sound got closer, still about eight to 10 feet off the ground. Now it was directly behind the tent, within about five or 10 feet. Right then I heard Sarah scream whisper my name, 
and I realized that she was awake and heard it too. She asked me what it was, and I told her it was fine, that it was just a deer, and to go back to sleep. She said, that doesn't sound like a deer. But I insisted it was, because I was too scared to make a run for the house with whatever this thing was right outside. So we listened to it slowly move around the tent, from left to right, still close, still making the sound every few seconds. And then, things got even weirder. It started moving around to the front of the tent, where the ground dropped off steeply, so each few feet forward was also several feet down. As this thing went around to the front, the sound stayed at the 8 to 10 foot height, and was slowly moving to the right. Now, if the thing making this sound was standing on the ground, it should have dropped several feet, but the sound stayed at the same height, all the way around. I even wondered if it was a bird, but it was moving too slowly, and that wouldn't account for the footsteps or hoofsteps that I heard before. After the sound and hoofsteps faded into the woods, Sarah and I just lay awake the rest of the night, too afraid to leave the tent. At first light, we booked it back to the house and told my uncle what had happened. Even though he didn't know what it was, he just shrugged and didn't seem too concerned. But that experience scared me so much that I've never been camping since. I know I didn't hallucinate it or imagine it because Sarah heard it too. Has anyone else ever heard of anything like this? I've asked friends who are avid outdoorsmen, hunters, trackers. None of them has ever heard of anything like this. Some people have suggested that this was a moose, but as far as I know, there aren't any in Pennsylvania. When I looked it up, it said that the last ones disappeared in the 1700s. And two, that tearing sound that it made stayed at the same height all the way around the tent. Like I said, if it was any sort of physical animal, it would have dropped a few feet when it walked in front of the tent. But maybe my logic is off. I don't know. But something was definitely off that night. When I was 14, I went camping in the summer with the girl guides. We only traveled a few miles away, to a place we had visited a few times before for game nights. Each year, our guides would merge with the two others in the area for a huge camp out for about five days. The place we were staying in was rumored to have a ghost in the main house. The story says it only shows itself to members of the family. We were staying on the large estate near the woods, right away from the house. I had been there quite a lot and I knew the grounds pretty well, which was awesome. I was staying in a tent with the younger girls, who ranged from ages 10 to 13, because I didn't have my own tent like the other older girls did. The first day and night went smoothly. We built a climbing frame, lit candles in the dark, and pretended that we had landed on an alien planet. A silly, fun game, but it's part of the story for later. The next morning, me and one of the other girls got up early. Our group's job was to collect firewood for breakfast, so we ventured into the woods on our own. We were joking around, grabbing wood as we walked. We ended up at the obstacle course and decided to play on it for a while, even though it was technically out of bounds. When we were done, we grabbed the firewood and started walking back to camp. The woods, to me, they felt and looked strange. It was as if the place was slightly different, slightly off from how I remembered it before. I decided to start trying to scare the girl I was with, just messing around, you know, trying to spook her for fun. Well, she got spooked and ran off and left me behind. That backfired. But I wasn't bothered as I slowly walked back. That was when I saw movement to my left, then again up ahead. As I was about to leave the woods, I saw a man out of the corner of my eye. He was wearing a white t-shirt and a cap, and carrying something long. Looking back, I think it was a shotgun. There was no one there. But I shrugged it off. Stuff like that doesn't bother me. I've seen stranger. Once out of the woods, everything goes back to normal. I looked back, and the woods were exactly as they should have been, 
not like they were a few moments ago. I don't know how to explain it. They just seemed newer for a while. Not as wild, I guess. But everything was kind of grainy and misty, except there was no actual mist, it just felt that way. It's really hard to explain. So I don't say anything more. I enjoy the camp out, we play games, sing songs, and just have fun. On the second to last day, we play a game. We had landed on the alien planet, and once we had breakfast, we had to go hide in the woods, build a shelter, a fire to make food, and people had to go steal food from the campsites without being seen. I am left in the woods on my own for ages as the other girls go about stealing the food. I built a pretty awesome shelter, but I realized that I needed my pen knife, which I'd left in my tent, so I went to get it. I get to the tent to find the kids I was sharing it with, bawling their eyes out, totally terrified. Eventually, I get the story out of them. They've been making their food when a man wearing a white shirt and a cap had appeared and then vanished in front of them, just where I had seen him. I assured the kids that it was fine and that whatever it was couldn't hurt them, and they eventually went back into the woods, but they were seriously shaken. I got the blame for telling them a scary story, but I had only tried to scare one girl at the very start, and I'd never mentioned anything about the man to anyone. That night was the campfire. As it ended, we all ran through the pitch black woods back to camp, leaving the person looking after us all alone in the woods. She had a light, so no big deal, right? She had to make sure the fire was out. I found out a week after that she had been terrified walking back to camp and refused to go into the woods again after that. In fact, she's refused to camp at that site ever since, but she won't tell us what she saw. The last day, I got bored packing up. After everything that had happened, I was kind of in a ghost hunting mood. So, me and a couple other girls went into the woods. I'm in the lead and I'm walking along a path. I stopped walking and I hear footsteps in front of us. Clear footsteps walking on dead leaves, but there were none. No one was walking anywhere near us either. I followed the sounds along a path. Someone had heavy boots on. It was so strange. We all had trainers on. The girls I was with were completely silent. They could hear it as well. I followed the sounds around to a clearing at the very edge of the woods where it stopped. I decided to sit down on the grass, and the other girls followed me, but they sat behind me because they were scared at this point. I do the whole, if there's anyone here, can you give me a sign routine? As I finished, a white mist suddenly fell over the woods. You could see things moving behind it, nothing clear. It hung in the air as the other two girls ran off screaming. I sat for a minute and watched it before saying, thank you. As I said this, it was like a gust of wind hit and it was gone, but there was no wind, it just felt that way. It was totally awesome. That was the last of the strange things for that camp. We had to finish packing up and left the camp that afternoon. I've been back a few times since and nothing strange has happened. The woods have always felt normal since then. It would have been a strange enough experience, but it got a little stranger when I did some research later on. Remember how I said that the ghosts there, by legend anyway, only showed themselves to family members? Well, a few years after this trip, I found out that I'm actually related to the family that owned the house and the estate. This happened to my girlfriend and I about two years ago. We were both in our late 20s. Thinking about it still makes my skin crawl and my heart pound. We camped for the night in Stanislaus National Forest, near Big Trees, California. We were only about 15 minutes off the main road, but still in a pretty remote area. Basically dirt fire roads and nothing but trees in all directions. We arrived in the early afternoon and set up camp in a nice clearing at the top of a hill beside the road. 
We drank some beer while we cooked dinner, saw maybe four cars go by in the hours between when we arrived and nightfall, all hunters leaving the forest. By about 7 p.m., the sun had mostly set, and it was getting dark. The solitude and peacefulness of the woods was nice, but it felt just a little odd being so secluded. I have been camping probably 50 times, but I've always been with a larger group or at a dedicated campsite. After dinner, when it was dark, we hung a bear bag with all of our food and stuff, smoked, laying back on a blanket, and looked up at the stars. I was feeling good and pretty much forgot about the fact that we were alone in the middle of nowhere. We got into the tent and sat in the darkness and talked for at least an hour. I'm a tall guy, but my two-man tent is high enough that I can sit up inside of it without a problem. The rain fly was laying on the top of the tent, kind of flung over the top, but not attached or staked down. It was fully covering one side and draped over so that the other side was mostly unobstructed. We had a clear view out of the mesh siding, and the trees were barely illuminated by the moon in front of us. Here's where it gets spooky. I'd been doing a lot of browsing on Reddit, and I decided to tell my girlfriend about r slash three kings. Basically, it's a sub dedicated to this spooky ritual where you sit in a darkened room at 3 a.m. and set up a candle and two mirrors, and through some combination of supernatural forces and sleep deprivation, images appear in the mirrors and speak to you. I was having fun scaring her, and to be honest, I was scaring myself a little too. The woods were dead silent, and there was absolutely no wind, no rustling, no air moving at all. It would have been very easy to feel even the slightest breeze sitting like we were. I paused in my story, and as I did, the rain fly started to ever so slowly draw back from the top of the tent. It didn't fall, it wasn't blown. Honest to God, it was as if somebody was carefully pulling it down from behind us. I'll never forget the sound it made. We turned and stared at each other wide-eyed, and my heart was in my throat. The fly continued to slide ever so slowly down the tent, until it was completely off. It was too dark to see clearly behind us but my mind conjured all the nightmarish beings I've ever seen in horror movies. I'd like to say that I sprang into action and ensured our safety, but I was literally frozen in fear. What a feeling. We sat in stunned silence for maybe 10 seconds, until I finally found it in myself to grab a flashlight and look behind us. There was nothing there. We breathed a huge sigh and started whispering feverishly, What the fuck? Did you... I got out and looked all around the clearing, but felt stupid after a while, and we went to sleep. The next morning, we woke up early and packed up camp. It was sunny and quiet, and I was happy to be in the woods, but I couldn't shake the eerie feeling from the night before. I was on my knees rolling up the tent, but I kept glancing through the trees around us, kind of compulsively, and my girlfriend was packing up breakfast about 30 feet from me. Again, there was absolutely nobody around, no birds chirping, no animals in sight. Then I heard from directly behind me two quick thwacks, like thock, thock. They were loud and about two seconds apart. Sort of like the sound of an axe hitting a tree, but a little blunter. I would judge the source of the sound as within a hundred feet from me. My girlfriend sprang up as I wheeled around to look behind me, but there was nothing there. We both said, okay, time to go, and left in a hurry. My heart didn't stop pounding until we were back on the main road. I've never been so thoroughly spooked for such an extended period of time in my entire life. I hope this story was interesting to some of you. Let me know if you have any idea what we experienced that night. When I was in sixth grade, I lived in a small town in northern Iowa. 
There was one little forested area just outside of town. My friends and I all lived in a trailer park, which was attached to the forest. We decided to go into the woods one night and just mess around. We were in there for around four hours when it happened. We were in the dead center of the woods, not having a care in the world. We were just standing and talking at this point. I heard footsteps and crushing leaves behind me. So I turned around and saw a figure standing there, just staring at me. My friends asked me what I was looking at, because they couldn't see what I was seeing. I told them that there was someone there, and then I realized that it didn't want to be seen. This must have been why I was the only one who saw it. It ran away when it noticed me staring back. My friends did hear the footsteps retreating from the area, but only I could see the source. We had decided to quietly and slowly walk out of the woods without encountering anything else that could be potentially dangerous. That did not save us from the terrifying sound that emanated from the general area that this thing ran toward. It was a loud, shrieking sound that closely resembled that of a hand moving up and down the strings of a piano. But it had a rusty and coarse sound added to it. We got the hell out of there as fast as we possibly could. We all decided not to stop and talk, we just kept on running to our own trailers. We never spoke of it after it occurred. I'm not really sure what we experienced that day. Based on some research, I think it could have been a banshee, but I'm not entirely sure. This story begins in either 2012 or 2013, I don't remember which. My two sisters, my dad, my stepmom, and I all went on a camping trip. I don't remember exactly where it was, but it was somewhere in England, and it was next to a farmer's field in a small town area. So me and my two sisters, Laura and Amy, were just messing around outside, playing, running around, things kids do. When all of a sudden, my sister Laura says, What's that? And points to an object in the sky. It was about 15 to 20 feet from the ground. This black, balloon-like object was moving in a straight line. Like, extremely straight. No twists, no turns. It wasn't going up or down, either. And it didn't seem to be affected by the wind. It was going at a constant speed in a perfectly straight line. It was about the size of a party balloon, but it was all black. The string or thread at the bottom wasn't swaying in the wind either. At first we thought it was just a stray balloon, but it couldn't have been. Because, like I said before, it was moving at a constant speed in a straight line, and I've never seen a balloon do that. This thing really disturbed me, and it actually made me feel sick to my stomach. When we got home two days later, I recalled the event to my older brother Jonathan who didn't come with us that time. He told me that it could have been a drone or something like that, but this thing was dead silent and it didn't seem to have any of the equipment like propellers and other things that drones typically do. I'm not sure if this was some kind of spirit or alien spacecraft, I don't really know what it was, but if you do, I'd love to know. I live in Indiana, and my parents have recently developed a love of camping. They've camped out throughout the state, but their favorite has been Summit Lake State Park. They've been asking me to camp with them forever, and I finally caved in and decided to go one weekend. That day, I bought a little tent for myself and a sleeping bag. I was excited to try camping for the first time and stopped by to get graham crackers, chocolate, and marshmallows, for s'mores of course. Finally, I hit the road toward Summit Lake and was feeling great. I had my music on in the car and overall I felt good. I get off the highway and take a country road toward the park. Suddenly, in an instant, I go from feeling excited and happy to extremely depressed. This sudden mood change rarely happens for me. I have no diagnosed psychological problems, no mood disorders, no history of anything like that. But for some reason, I just wanted to start crying. 
It's really difficult for me to explain this feeling, but everything around me suddenly felt different. The colors were off. I had a cloud of sadness hanging over me. I just wanted to turn around and go back home so I could curl up and cry in my bed. The rest of the camping trip was fine, but that experience on the way there, running across that pocket of negative energy or whatever it was, was so impactful that I didn't want to go back there. I was just talking to my mom recently, and she was looking at places to camp this weekend. She mentioned Summit Lake and asked me if I'd like to come again, but I said no. I told her what happened to me last time. I told the story before to my brother and a few of my friends when they asked me about my first camping trip. I told her the same story as I did to them. Once I finished telling her my experience, she was completely silent. And then she said that the exact same thing happened to her in the same place. She told me that she and my dad would be singing during the ride, but once they get off the highway, she gets depressed and just wants to cry. They may even argue. Just like my experience, she was excited and happy, but then a strong urge to cry washed over her. She said that this happens to her every single time, but she's always provided some sort of excuse for why she's feeling that way, and since it goes away as soon as they get there, she figured it was no big deal. She even said that she was hesitant to say the same thing happened to her after hearing my story because it seemed so unreal. I tend to be skeptical when it comes to paranormal things and things like negative energy, but I had to look up if anything happened in that area. I googled Indian massacres in Indiana because that's probably what happened, right? And the first thing that pops up is the Fall Creek Massacre. In the spring of 1824, a group of white settlers slaughtered nine Native Americans, including two men, three women, two boys, and two girls. Guess where? Right when you get off the highway and on to the road towards Summit Lake. I still tend to be a skeptic, but this experience has made me believe that negative energy in some form exists in places where awful things have happened, such as the site of a massacre. This happened many years ago, but it has to be the creepiest thing I've ever experienced when it comes to this kind of stuff. And one that I can't really explain to myself. This happened while I was camping with a few friends of mine. While the others took a bath or just hung out around the campfire, I decided that I would take a short walk through the woods, which I did. When I arrived at the entrance to the woods, I suddenly hear a woman humming a tune in the bushes. The thing that I find creepy as hell is the fact that I was completely alone. No one was with me. I had clear line of sight into the bush, which I know for a fact was empty. No woman, no radio, no music, no other campers, nothing. Yet I still know I heard her hum. It was clear as day, like she was standing right next to me. I ran back to the campsite where I told everybody else. Of course, nobody believed me. I'm still not entirely sure what happened, but this has to be the creepiest experience I've ever witnessed. About two years ago, my husband and I took our five kids to a water theme park in Idaho. We live in Washington State. For the life of me, I can't remember the name of the park. We borrowed my dad's trailer and truck and thought it would be less expensive and more fun if we camped at a campground down the road rather than the one that was made for the park. I've driven through Idaho before, and so has my husband, but we've never stayed here before. To preface my experience, I have had nightmares on occasion where I felt like something was trying to possess me. I always end up reciting the Lord's Prayer or calling out to Jesus and it goes away. I'll be honest, sometimes it takes a couple of tries, and I always have my husband wake me up because I'm screaming. I regularly pray for protection, wear protective crystals, and ask my guardians for protection also. I feel as though because I regularly research and read into the paranormal, it's best to take precautions. 
So here we are at this campground. The first night everything was great. Nothing happened. The next day we take the kids to the park, spend all day there, and come back to cook dinner and get ready for bed. I also have to say that while I've read a lot about sleep paralysis, I've never experienced it until this night, and I haven't since. Once we're all in bed, I start to fall asleep. While asleep, I feel awake. I can see the trailer around me in kind of what's like a blur. I'm unable to shout, or scream, or move, but I'm very aware. I look to the end of my bed and see what looks like a short, four foot or so demon looking thing. In my head, it feels like it's something with horns. It's difficult to make out and its face is absolutely terrifying. All of a sudden, I feel my husband grab my arm, and I'm awake. He says, you were screaming, are you okay? I told him I was fine, and I tried to go back to sleep. But the same thing happened again. Except this time, the demon thing was closer to me. I remember in my head shouting, Jesus is my savior, go away. But he wouldn't. I remember trying to scream for my husband, but I couldn't. Then once again, my husband grabs my arm, wakes me up, and said that I was still screaming. At this point, I still told him that I was fine. I attempted to sleep once more, and the same thing happened again. And again, the demon thing was even closer. No matter what I tried, it wouldn't leave, and my husband kept having to wake me up. This time, I told him what was going on. He said that he was really sorry. I didn't try to fall back asleep that time. I just wrapped as much of him around me as I could and desperately tried not to fall asleep. He was my only protection, I felt. I felt like something was trying to pull me into sleep, but I fought it. The next thing I know, I woke up the next morning and told my husband the entire story. I've never researched the area, I can't remember the name of the campground, that I was so terrified that I haven't really shared this story until recently. I have no idea what happened to me that night, but I hope it never happens again. So my friend's grandpa has this cabin property up a canyon in Deschain County, Utah. It had a fire burn through a few years ago and the cabin was lost. Now it's just a bunch of burnt trees with quaking aspen saplings popping up everywhere. Last summer, my friend and I went up there to camp because it's pretty out of the way and it's private land. To get there, you have to go through a road blocked off by a locked gate, and everything is super overgrown. Getting there was really tough. I say all this to make sure that you know that we were definitely alone up there. This is not an area people can just happen by. You would have to know where it was, how to get there, and then tough through it. Anyway, we found a spot to tent up above his cabin on the gravel roundabout road that circled the cabin. That night, while settling down, we heard a sound outside our tent. It wasn't a small animal, and it wasn't a four-legged creature. It sounded like two heavy boots walking. Anybody who walks in gravel knows the difference between two feet walking and four feet. It went all around the tent and then left. Needless to say, we slept by our rifles that night. Not sure how related it might be, but the property is around 30 miles south from the infamous Skinwalker Ranch as the crow flies. We haven't been back since. I was camping with my girlfriend at the time. We did the normal camping things, setting up the tent, making a fire, and so on. It got late, so we let the fire die down and went into the tent and laid there for about 30 to 40 minutes, when we saw an orange glow coming from the other side of the tent. We went out to look, thinking maybe the coals of the fire had lit back up or something. We didn't see the fire, but off in the distance, we saw an orange, hazy ball of light bobbing around in the air between the trees. 
When we stared at it and began discussing what it was and whether or not we should follow it, it stopped moving and just hovered there a moment before slowly taking off to the left. We knew that in that area, there was a really nasty drop off, so we didn't follow it. We were thinking about what to do and went back to the tent, pretending it never happened. And after some difficulty, we fell asleep. We woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of what we assumed were trees falling. Later, when the sun was up, we went outside to look around, but didn't see anything out of place. I have no idea what happened to us that night, but it was definitely one of the creepiest camping experiences I've ever had. My best friend B and I whistle back and forth. We've been friends for a few years, and it's something that we picked up. When she's trying to locate me, or when I'm trying to get her attention, we whistle. A real simple, one single high tune, followed by one low tune. We decided to take an off-season camping trip in Pace in Arizona. We didn't expect it to be as cold as it was there, and we didn't expect to be one of the only three campers on the mountain. One of the evenings we were there, the campers next to us said they were expecting up to five inches of snow through the night. So I made it my mission to get as much firewood as I could before the sun went down. I got all the wood around our campsite right next to the lake, but I was still not satisfied. So I decided to take B's forerunner out of the camp and up into the woods. When I made it out of the campsite, it got pretty eerie. There's just something about being alone in the woods that makes you feel like you're not alone in the woods. But it's nothing I haven't done before, and I had my pistol on me. So I managed to push past my paranoia and get some wood. I was driving and walking for a good hour, got a few more bundles, and I was driving slowly past a clearing when I see this fresh log overturned. It was a beauty, and I had to have it. So I parked the runner and started trekking through. I got about halfway, and I hear a whistle. Two-toned, one high, one low, really close to me. If I hadn't seen my friend in the rear view at the bottom of the rim, I would have assumed she was just messing with me. I stopped cold, did a full 360, but sure enough, I was alone. I hightailed it to that log, sprinted back to the runner, and went back to camp. I found B chilling next to the fire. I'm not really sure what to make of it, but it scared the heck out of me. When I was about six years old, I woke up during the night and made eye contact with a strange humanoid creature. It was looking at me through my bedroom window. My room was ground level and my bed was facing the window. Strangely, I remember choosing to leave my curtains open that night for the first time ever. So whatever this thing was, was in full view. When I initially saw it, I was completely dumbfounded and couldn't believe my eyes. I shook my head no, as I was thinking that this couldn't really be happening. I pinched myself to make sure that I wasn't dreaming. Then, the creature frowned. I nodded my head yes, and the creature smiled. Again, I shook my head no, and it frowned. So I nodded, and once again, it smiled. I may have repeated this a few more times. Whatever it was seemed to be almost greenish in color and had a roundish face. Kind of like Yoda. I can't remember all of the details, but I distinctly remember telling myself that this was really happening and not to allow myself to chalk it up later to being a dream. I kept telling myself over and over, this was real, this was not a dream. This was real. I still have no idea what that thing was. I just talked to my buddy tonight on the phone for a few minutes. While we were talking, I asked him where he was. He said he was in the desert of Arizona at that exact moment. 
Just for the heck of it, I asked him if he had seen any weird UFOs out on those open highways driving at night. And this was his reply. No, I haven't seen anything like that. But about three months ago, I was out here driving and it was late at night. I was in the desert. I noticed something on the side of the road. At first, I thought it was somebody wearing a raincoat. It was about five feet tall, shaped like a human, and was black. As I got closer to it, it spread out wings, and then went straight up into the air. It didn't flap its wings, or anything like that, it just went straight up and out of sight, very quickly. I was like, wow, no kidding. He said he thought about it, and then told me maybe it was a condor, but I was like, no man, those kinds of birds have to get a running start, and it takes them a few feet to even get off the ground. It's too bad he didn't get a better look at what he was actually seeing before it took off. As we were talking, his signal started to go in and out, so I let him go. I'm going to try to talk to him this weekend when he's back home and see what else he's experienced. But, yeah, apparently he saw a humanoid. He's a trucker, so he gets to go all over, and I'm sure he's seen some other things as well. I can't wait to find out the rest of his story. Somewhere around 2013 or 2014, I was leading my sister, who was then about 15 or 16, to a forest that I would sometimes go to with a friend. The way it was set up is there was this giant ditch or valley that had a bunch of water in the bottom. So if you fell, you could easily get injured or drown from the size of it. The ditch went in a straight line in front of the forest and there was this little concrete dam type thing that you could walk on to get across to the forest. It's nighttime, and I've never been there at night. My sister wanted a place to smoke cigarettes, so we walked there with one of her other friends who was like 17 or 18. As we got up to the dam, we all see this 5 to 7 foot tall person type thing, and as soon as it sees us, it starts jumping towards us, about 4 feet in the air. Its movement was a little clumsy, if I can remember right. When it started jumping, we all ran as quickly as we could and went back home. It was shaped like a human, but its legs looked like a goat. It almost looked like it was wearing a light gray jacket, but maybe it was fur. There was very little light, so it was hard to see well. We never told anybody about it because we were all underage told our parents that we were going to church, didn't tell them we were going to wander around, so we didn't want to get in trouble. I don't think there was some Olympic jumper out there doing weird stuff in the forest either. The forest has signs all around it saying to stay out, so I don't think people would really do that. One time after my sister turned 18, I texted her about it. She said that she remembers the thing being all black, so either one of us might be right. I'm not really sure what we saw. I know that there have been Goatman sightings out in that area for decades, so maybe that was it. If you have any ideas, let me know. I'm an outdoorsman. I'm very experienced in hunting, camping, hiking, and general survival. I'm very familiar with and used to wildlife and I was charged by what I believe was a cryptid called a dogman. It charged both my cousin and I. It was not a bear. A bear cannot move how this thing did. And it wasn't a normal wolf, as they can't comfortably run on two legs. Whereas what charged us seemed natural at doing that. This happened around June or July of 2007. I was around 17 years old, and a lot more cocky then but I still was somewhat knowledgeable of the outdoors. My family used to own a cabin in northwest Wisconsin. I basically grew up there in the summer. I knew the woods well, but at night it was wise to stay in the cabin, or at least by the bonfire at the beach, because of bears, wolves, and cougars. One of the creepiest things was if you were having a bonfire, the tree line was visible from the fire pit and the beach, and at night, 
you always felt like you were being watched from that tree line. But during the day, the woods always seemed normal, not so creepy at all. That is, until this incident. So this happened somewhere between noon and four o'clock. My cousin and I were having an airsoft battle. I was in full woodland camo. He was not. I retreated onto the ATV trail into the woods for a tactical advantage, and our battle took us about 200 meters in to about a third of the way up the trail. We had enough at this point and were standing at the edge of a clearing on the trail, just talking, and he was maybe 10 feet from me when I decided to mess with him. I shushed him and said, we're being watched. He froze, but then I realized that the woods were dead quiet and I got spooked. At that point, it wasn't so much of a joke. I started to scan the tree line and the other edge of the clearing from left to right when I saw it. Its teeth gave it away. It was panting and staring at my cousin. I don't expect you to believe me, but what I saw was a wolf-type creature as big as a black bear, at least 300 pounds, but it wasn't normal. This wolf was on two legs, crouching next to a tree with its arm grasping the tree, grasping with a clawed hand. It had reddish-brown fur. I told my cousin, we have to go, and the next thing I know, he's sprinting. I looked back at Wolfie, who had locked on and sprinted a few steps on two feet. Then I turned and ran as fast as I could. Right before I turned, it looked like Wolfie was dropping onto all fours. It charged us, and it sounded like it was right on our asses as we barreled through the brush. But for whatever reason, it let us go when we broke out of the tree line and headed for the cabin. What stuck with me the most was the sheer size of this thing. Wolfie appeared to be about seven feet tall when upright, and that where it should have had front paws, it appeared to have large, clawed hands. Now I'm not sure how to explain this away rationally. I've heard wolves will occasionally kind of walk upright, but as far as I know, they only go a couple of steps, and they certainly can't sprint on two legs. Nor do wolves get that big, and black bears sort of waddle on two legs so it couldn't have been either of those creatures. The closest description, as silly as it sounds, is a werewolf or a dogman. This happened to myself, my little brother, and my cousin when I was about 14 years old. It was just around dusk. We all lived in Tampico, Tamaulipas, Mexico. We decided to go play basketball at the outside courts. It was still daylight when we first got there, and we usually start heading home at about dusk or when the court lights come on. It was only a few blocks away from our grandma's house. When the lights come on, that's usually when the bigger kids get to the court to play. But this time we were fortunate enough to have the whole court to ourselves. We were shooting hoops like normal, nothing out of the ordinary and the lights came on. But since we had the place to ourselves and we were having so much fun, we kept playing. The game was 21, so two of us would stand to the side of the hoop, depending on which direction the ball would go, so that it wouldn't roll into the street. And on one of these shots that my cousin made, the ball just missed the hoop and bounced behind it. I managed to grab it before leaving the court when I saw a strange creature. It was like a little person, no bigger than two feet. It had the face of a very old man with a fairly large nose, old ragged clothes that looked like they were handmade, and a hat that, I swear, looks like something a garden gnome would wear. You know, it was one of those pointy hats, but it wasn't straight up, it sort of hung down to the side. It was crouched down, almost like it was in hiding, and when I got too close to it, that's when it stood up, looked at me, and then ran away from me. Believe me, my first thought was not to chase it. I was scared stiff, but my cousin and little brother saw it too, and they ran. When it ran, it was headed for the other side of the court. I couldn't believe the speed of this thing. I mean, for it to be so small, it made it to the other side in mere seconds, almost the blink of an eye. 
It ran behind the post and was gone. I snapped out of it and I started to run home as well. And as I ran past that same post that this thing ran behind, I turned to look to see if it was there, but it was gone. When I got home, my little brother and cousin had already told the adults there what had happened. They didn't tell us we were crazy. In fact, they told us that these little creatures are called duendes. Apparently, there are different types of them too, so I guess they're sort of a widely known creature where I live. I had never heard about them growing up, but that was my experience. You can believe me or not, but I hope you enjoyed the story either way. I had a rather odd encounter with some humanoid creature, or even a spirit possibly, just a few nights ago. I haven't been able to come up with a rational answer as to just what I saw. It happened just a few nights ago. I was biking home from work. I work the closing shifts for my local Walgreens, so I get off work around 10.30. I live only a half hour away by bike from my job, but most of the way home is by a heavily forested trail, which doesn't have very many street lights. It's always pitch black when I'm on my way home. I'm about five minutes into this bike ride, and I hit the beginning of where the street lights end and the darkness begins. As I always do, I pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight option so I could see. Only a few seconds after I turned it on, I tilted it up more and froze. I saw this tall, skinny, pale-looking figure for just a brief second before it fell onto all fours and, just like the wind, was gone into the woods. Shortly after, I started to pedal as fast as I could because I had no clue what I had seen and I didn't want to be in the same woods as it was. That's when I heard a low screech. Whatever it was was keeping pace with me, hidden in the woods out of sight. I managed to get out of that area very quickly, and I didn't see or hear anything after I left that heavily wooded area. But a while later on, I caught scent of what literally smelled like fresh blueberry pancakes or waffles. It was like somebody was standing out in the field with a hot plate of just the pan of blueberry pancakes, which it didn't make any sense to me. There are no buildings or shops in the area where that scent came from. I figured that perhaps whatever it was I had seen was using the scent to try to draw me back into the woods. Now, I do know a few areas around that trail are supposedly haunted. There's a dinner theater that's not too far from it and a supposedly haunted water tower in the area as well, and a few other places. But still, no matter what I can think of, I can't rationalize it or debunk it as something else. It couldn't have been a deer, because I've talked to people around the area, and no one has seen a deer in the area ever. Besides, it was standing on two feet when I first saw it, like a human. It couldn't have been any other wildlife, because the only wildlife I've ever spotted there are squirrels and birds. But I figured I would share my experience and see if anybody else has had something similar happen, or see if anybody knows what it is I saw. This happened when I was about seven years old to my uncle. He's no longer with us, and I wanted to share his story. Growing up, I lived in northern Michigan on 5,000 acres of farm and ranch land that backed up into state land. Nothing but miles of forest and pasture could be seen. Needless to say, it made us pretty tough, and it takes a lot to spook us. We're all avid hunters, fishermen, and outdoorsmen. Being the only girl, I was raised as a tomboy, and I'm just the same. My uncle went off to join the military, becoming a senior NCO in a prominent Special Forces division of the U.S. Navy. He was 6'4", built like a wrestler, obviously skilled in survival tactics, and nothing rattled him. He was home on leave and went out hunting as it was deer season. I remember him coming in the house, shaking and crying, saying that he saw something in the woods. My uncle never cried. He was tough as nails and would tear someone to shreds before he let them make him cry. My grandmother tried to get him to make sense, 
but he kept saying that he saw Bigfoot mixed with the wolf. My granny immediately got my grandfather, and he rounded up the rest of the guys. The hunting squad went out, which was my dad, a few male cousins, my uncle, who was still terrified but didn't want to be labeled a chicken, and a couple of other guys. They all got their shotguns and ammunition and saddled the horses to go clear the woods. Apparently, they were aware of the dogman, but I was blissfully young and ignorant. They told me to stay inside, and said that for absolutely no reason was I to step outside of our house until they returned. I had never heard my dad or grandfather so serious, so I hid in my room. Sunset comes, and they still aren't back. I'm really worried at this point, because they've never stayed in the woods after dark. Shortly, I heard the sound of the horses running to the barn, and their voices. I was so relieved. They looked troubled when they came into the house, but didn't say anything, probably not to spook me. At dinner, my dad laid down the law that I was no longer allowed to play outside or go to the barns alone. I had to have my grandfather with me at all times. Of course, I was pretty upset by this and felt that my independence was being taken away, but I obeyed. The next morning, my dad and grandfather taught me how to shoot. That's when I knew it was serious. I overheard the adults talking the next night. Apparently, there were tracks where my uncle had his sighting bigger than any wolf could make, but definitely not dog tracks. As I said before, we're all avid outdoorsmen, and we can definitely identify tracks. My family has identified the tracks of just about every animal in that area, and some outside of it, but these couldn't be identified. About eight feet up in a tree were claw marks. No Michigan bear could make those. We also found claw marks of about the same height on multiple trees throughout the property. There were cattle mutilated and not in any way that a coyote or bear would, and it lasted the whole winter. We lost about 30 to 40 cattle that winter, all of them mutilated, all with the same wolf dog tracks in the snow. I really feel like this experience changed my uncle. Who knows, he did multiple tours in the Middle East for Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom before unfortunately finally taking his own life. After that experience, though, he was never the same. He never touched alcohol before this. But after this, I never saw him without a bottle of Jack in his hand. And his eyes were always haunted. He changed his personality. He never even went out in the woods again. He quit hunting and he eventually just quit coming home to visit on leave. He didn't even come home for my dad's funeral two years later. It was heartbreaking to see him deteriorate the way he did. I truly believe that he saw something out there, and while he might have gotten away that day, it ultimately killed him. We're from a small town in southern Ohio, about an hour east of Cincinnati. This town has been plagued with people dying young, and some in pretty gruesome ways. Google Cheryl Fossil as an example. Many believe that this is caused by activity around the area, or that it's the cause of the activity. There's a section of woods that seems to have concentrated activity though. The woods in question are surrounded by two churches, a hospital, and an area of housing. Now, as full disclosure, things don't happen every time we go in, but when things do happen, they happen off the charts. The most common things that we've experienced are what we've dubbed the geeks. We call these things geeks because they're tall, sometimes 12 feet from toe to crown, and gangly. They move awkwardly, although they move between trees swiftly. They never present themselves outwardly, only glimpses of them as they move between trees. The scariest thing about them, however, is the sound right before they start moving. It's almost like a deep groan. The second that I want to talk about is Hydra. Only one of us have ever seen this thing, and so far has been the only one witnessed. It's like a small primate creature with the face of a hideous woman. 
the body of a chimpanzee, and long greasy black hair with boils on its back, blood red boils. The member of our group who had encountered this thing refused to tell us what Hydra spoke to him about. These are some of the things that we've encountered. We're working on a documentary about what's going on in this area and the town itself. I'll keep everybody who's interested updated, but I really hope that somebody else has had similar experiences. We would love to find out what's going on in the woods. After she had surgery for her kidney stones, my grandma became more sensitive about things. Exactly after the surgery, while she was still in the hospital, we both met in our dreams. She's seen me in her dream, and I've seen her in my similar dream on the same night. There's a lot to say about that too, but that's a story for another day. About a half a year later, she kept mentioning the little ugly people coming out of this particular flower pot in her apartment. According to her, they would come out during the nighttime or very early in the morning, just rising from the flower pot walking a little bit around the room, and then going back into the flower pot and decreasing in size until the flower pot would swallow them. Bear in mind, this happened around 10 years ago. She told the entire family, and even though my mom and I are believers of the paranormal, we thought it might be age that was speaking in this case. Maybe she was hallucinating. Maybe it was sleep paralysis. But no, she kept insisting and insisting that she sees them every night. Then she kept giving us details. We suggested she might be dreaming, and she would respond that she would get up and turn on the lights every time. They seemed to wake her up almost every night. On some nights, she would go to my grandpa in his bedroom. They were sleeping separately because they enjoyed the solitude and comfort and she would wake him up and say, they're back. By the time my grandpa would come into her room, nothing was there. One night, she called my mom to say that they've woken her up again. She gave us a lot of details about these creatures, that they were small but quite ugly. That's why she named them the little ugly people. They were maximum one meter in height. They were weirdly dressed. Later on, she described them better and I came to the conclusion that the fashion style would be around the 1800s. They also had hats. They were both male and female, and it was only one of them coming out per night, never more of them, even though I do refer to them as plural. It seemed that they were struggling a bit to get out of the flower pot, and by implication, the flower, which was just a normal apartment plant. She tried to communicate with them every time, but with no success. They never hurt her, and they weren't doing anything to the objects in the room. They walked around the room, sometimes going to a different flower pot, and disappearing there. There were times when she lost it and started screaming at them, and telling them to leave her alone. One time she said she woke up and looked around and there was a tiny creature staring at her. Most of the time, they were staring at her. Also, some of them had beards. We've searched for a very long time for any kind of reasonable explanation. Then we started to believe her, and we searched for a paranormal one. I posted on a paranormal forum many, many years ago, and the answer I received was that they were gnomes visiting my grandma, and that she should not interact with them, as they might get aggressive and dangerous. They suggested putting rocks in a circle around the flower pot, and we did. I don't recall any other suggestion. This went on for more than a year. After about six months of quiet after we put the stones out, she started to forget things. Soon after, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, which she bravely battled for another two to three years. She's no longer with us, and I miss her, but sometimes I still meet her in my dreams. We started to think that maybe, since she ultimately was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, she was hallucinating. But that doesn't explain why after we put the stones out, it stopped happening. Unless it was power of suggestion. Whether it was something 
medical or paranormal, it was still a really bizarre thing, and I'll never forget it. One of the more curious paranormal incidents in Georgia is the Georgia werewolf, Emily Isabella Burt. Apparently, Miss Burt was a resident of Talbot County, a rural county in southwest Georgia, between Macon and Columbus. The Burt family, a wealthy and prominent family in the Talbot County community, had several children. Of all of her children, it appears that Emily Isabella was the one with the most problems. For one, she had inherited a lot of physical traits from her father, including dark hair and bushy eyebrows. However, she was said to have had sharp, white canine teeth that made her smile quite disturbing. In one report, Roberts claims that Emily Isabella's mother took her to a local dentist to see if the teeth could be altered in any way, but he could do nothing for her. Soon afterward, she felt ill and suffered from restless nights. Emily is said to have strangely wandered the country during her restless nights. Legend has it that the beau of one of Emily Isabella's sisters, a William Gorman, reported to the birds that something was killing his sheep. Fearful that this may soon be happening to her animals, Mrs. Mildred Burt became quite concerned. On ensuing visits, Gorman would recount stories about more sheep killings and that some of his cattle were killed as well. He was concerned about the killings and decided to take action. He reported that he was going to be putting together what amounted to a posse. Their intentions were to shoot and kill whatever beast was doing the damage. Emily Isabella was unusually interested in what was going on and what events had transgressed in the hunt for this animal. On the night of the big hunt, Mildred Burt, who had also inherited more than a few guns and was a great markswoman, went out with her pistol. She apparently suspected that Emily Isabella was somehow involved with the killings and she wanted to be prepared for anything. As she was near the area, an animal lunged for her, and she fired. It ran away. Interestingly enough, the next morning it was reported that Emily Isabella had a bullet hole in her left hand. After being taken to a local physician, her mother decided to send her to Paris to be treated by a doctor who specialized in lycanthropy, a disorder that makes its victims think that they're werewolves. While she was in Paris, the attacks at home stopped, and, once she returned, supposedly cured, the attacks fell to a minimum. Emily died in 1911, and is buried in a small cemetery out in the wilderness of Georgia. To this day, a number of paranormal incidents are reported in that area, with the grave itself generally believed to be haunted by the ghost of the werewolf. People report a strange stillness or a sense of unease around the cemetery, and the grave itself is strangely well kept, even though the cemetery is overgrown and forgotten. Others have reported that when small tokens, like a chip of stone, are taken from the cemetery, bad things happen to those people not long afterward. There are even some people who note that even just speaking poorly of Emily or her family causes the same problems to happen, as if the werewolf does not want anybody to speak ill of her. In college, I lived up on top of a mountain road, but still only five miles to town, down a trail through the woods. There was a hundred plus year old oak in the yard, slab stone porch built by hand. I lived in the studio apartment that was outside of the main house. The main house was haunted, but my shack was cozy. The woods up there were weird, too. I never really was in the main house at all, but the three who lived there said some nights you couldn't sleep for all the noise. Floorboards creaking, thumps and knocks, that kind of thing. My experiences happened outside. 
Like I said, I hunted small game up there, as there must have been a rabbit colony in the vicinity, plus a few squirrel drays. Often out there while I was stalking, I'd get the distinct feeling of being stalked myself. Keep in mind, this stand of forest is only several acres, but was preserved mainly because of the historic oak trees scattered around. It's old woods. I would hear laughter, like children's laughter, but not quite like in a creepy movie. It was a bit distorted, and almost like flirty giggles that you imagine a fairy might make. It would come from a different direction each time I sought it. I eventually decided to stop following it and hunt. It never did stop. I would sometimes spend an afternoon in town having drinks or hanging at my friend's place. I'd finally leave and have enough liquid courage to hike back up the trail in the dark. That laughter would be replaced by noise, just like things running all around you and dashing about in the trees. I've been an outdoorsman for a long time, and I know the woods are noisy at night, particularly in the southern Appalachians. But this was different. It was dead silent out there, in that stand at night, except for this rushing to and fro by some unseen feet. Not like game fleeing, though. Deer run away and crash about doing it. I was a big-time night owl back then, and was regularly up doing schoolwork until three or four in the morning. One such night, it had just snowed a fresh 20 inches or so, decent accumulation for the area. Our yard and the woods were like a paradise for me and my dog. I was excited to hunt around the next day for tracks and see if I couldn't locate the rabbit den precisely. I was up working and the dog came scratching to get in, not frantic or anything. I let her in and she lay down to sleep. Odd, because she's a husky and preferred the snow to my tiny heated apartment every time. I decided to call it a night too and went out for a cigarette. It was 3.24 in the morning. I can still see it on top of my MacBook display before I closed it. I went out and noted that the clouds were dispersed a bit and the moon was bright on the snow. I lit my cigarette and was just looking out across the fence and into the woods when something caught my eye. It looked just like a silhouette of somebody leaning against one of those big oak trees, like you'd see somebody with a palm planted against a wall with the arm straight out, leaning against it. It's not moving, so I can't tell if I'm just tired, or the lighting is funny, or what. So I walked further to the end of the porch, and as soon as I stepped off onto the fresh snow, it took off. The thing was tall. My estimates based on that tree put the thing at seven feet. It ran along the border of the fence and back off into the woods. It was hairless, as far as I can tell, and completely naked. Otherwise, though, its form was just that of a tall, skinny man. I went inside and switched to boots, grabbed my rifle and my flashlight, and I went to check the tracks. I picked up what had to be a set of size 14 or 15 barefoot tracks. It ran along the fence and down the treeless stretch of backyard, as if heading into the woods. But then, the tracks just ended, about 20 feet short of the wood line. I don't know if it jumped to the tree line or what. It probably could have, but there weren't any more tracks that I could find that night or the next day. It was like it just vanished. Never could explain that one. So this happened last year in Virginia, and is also the reason I never backpack alone anymore. I was taking summer courses at the time, and we ended up with a three-day weekend in June. So I thought it was a great time to go explore some of the Virginian wilderness. I did a Google search, found a state park with a trail that looked nice, and let my roommate and family know the trail I was going to be on. When I got close to the park area, I saw a little outdoor shop where people hiking the Appalachian Trail stop. I went in to grab a map of the area, just in case I got lost. 
As I was talking to the owner, he mentioned a trail that's not well known, that has a pretty cool waterfall and a swimming hole. This piqued my interest, so I had him show me on the map. It took me outside the state park, but he said it was a great place to go. I paid for the map and thanked the owner. I texted my roommate and my parents about the new trail, and I parked my car and set off on my adventure. I should note that the waterfall was going to be a side trip from my journey. I was planning three days and two nights. I started on part of the Appalachian Trail, and it was pretty packed with people, and some of them are really fun to talk to. As expected, I got further and further from the main trails, and I saw fewer and fewer people. Around early afternoon, three miles from my destination, I noticed it was unnaturally silent. No birds, no bugs, not even wind, and I had the distinct feeling of being watched. I shook it off as me overanalyzing the situation. I got to the waterfall and it wasn't too spectacular, but it was cool to look at. Plus, it had a good size area to swim in, so naturally I stripped down to my skivvies and took a dip. It was pretty refreshing. As I was getting my clothes back on, I started whistling to myself. That's when I heard something whistle the same tune back. I thought it was a bird copying me, so I went back and forth with it, and it would repeat whatever I whistled. I thought it was pretty neat. As I was setting up camp, I couldn't shake this feeling that I was being watched again. Like I would get goosebumps, and my hair would stand up on end. As night fell, I built a small fire and lit my jet boil to make some dinner. As I did this, I became hyper aware that again, there was no sound, just deafening silence. Some part of my brain was telling me that I wasn't safe and that I should leave. I ignored it and crawled into my tent with my flashlight and book. I went to sleep without incident. When I woke up the next morning, my sight was trashed. My camp stool was nowhere to be found. My bear bag with my food was cut down and the contents were thrown across the site. My first thought was that a crafty animal had chewed through the rope and got the bag. But I looked at the rope and it was cut with something very sharp. Plus, none of the food was even touched. I also noticed bear footprints human footprints, all around my campsite. Keep in mind, I'm at least six to eight miles from any road. As I was looking at the mess, I heard a branch snap off in the distance. I turned to look in that direction. I saw nothing, but I heard that whistling again, my whistle from yesterday, but it was different. It sounded more sinister. It made my hair stand on end, and this is when I listened to my instincts to get the hell out of there. It sounded like it was a little off in the distance, so I packed up my camp as fast as I could. As I did, the whistling got closer and closer as I finally finished stuffing the tent into my bag. I didn't even bother with putting anything away properly. I just wanted to get out. The whistling was incessant and sounded like it was coming from all directions. I got fed up with it and finally I stood and yelled into the woods, shut up, what the hell do you want? It stopped whistling and it was quiet for a moment. And then it repeated everything I had just said in my voice. It sounded just like me but distorted, like it was coming from an old television. After I heard this, I immediately threw my pack on and ran in the direction I'd come from. I heard it moving, just behind me, fast switching between the whistle and my voice. It felt like it was toying with me, not coming too close, but never being too far. Eventually, it sounded like it got farther and farther away from me, and then it suddenly stopped. 
When it stopped, I stopped and turned around. I wish I never had, because I heard the most bone-chilling screech I've ever heard coming from right next to me. That's when I started running again. I didn't look, I just ran. Less than a half mile, I ran into a couple that was also backpacking. They saw the look of terror on my face and asked if it was me that had screamed and asked if I was okay. I told them about what happened and they decided not to go down from where I had just come from. We moved to a more populated trail and as quickly as we could, all got the hell out of there. As soon as I got back in my car, I drove to one of the park's ranger stations and reported what had happened. Since the site was off park grounds, they told me it wasn't in their jurisdiction, but that they would send a ranger to investigate. The ranger station's parking lot runs right up to the woods. As I was getting into my jeep, I hear the whistling coming from the woods just in front of me. The neighborhood where I grew up was more or less suburbs, except the back end of it borders a massive field where nothing has been planted for decades. Part of that border is buffered by woods, and it's in those woods where my friends and I would always play. One sunny day, we were particularly deep in the little section of forest. We were attempting to pick through what looked like very overgrown dozer tracks. The woods are thick across North Carolina, but the central and eastern portion is thick with kudzu in particular, and it was giving us hell. We had probably made a mile of progress into this track when we came across a depression full of water. I hesitate to even say that it was a pond because it was perfectly round like a crater. The water had obviously receded and in the middle of it was the exposed roof of an old car. At about that time, one friend found a license plate under the pine duff. It was tagged with buckshot. Next, a door, a full car door, half buried under pine duff, riddled with bullet holes and shot. Certainly not an uncommon way to have fun in the South, go out, have a few beers with your buddies and see some old junk. But what we found next wasn't a run of the mill Saturday night, bones. Our still innocent minds first assumed it was a white tailed deer. We started dragging out bones and laying them out side by side. I'm not sure if our objective was to make a museum quality deer skeleton or what, but that's what we did. Then, the pelvis came up. I recognized it immediately because my uncle was a chiropractor and had a full model skeleton in his office named Mr. Bones that I would always look at. The more I started to look at our growing collection, the more I started to see Mr. Bones taking shape. I got this weird gut feeling, and being the oldest, I told everybody to stop digging and that we needed to go. There was some protest, but I convinced everyone that this was the best thing to do. We hiked back the way we'd been coming in and went back to the pool down the road, finished out the day and went home. But I couldn't stop thinking about those bones. That night, I told my mom about what we had found. Then I had to tell dad the story. At first, they weren't convinced, but I wasn't a dumb kid. I knew what I had seen out there. They talked behind closed doors, going back and forth. The next day, I told the story to two sheriff's deputies and took them to the area where we had entered the woods. About an hour later, there were police vehicles packing the tiny dead end leading off to the woods. Chainsaws cleared brush and men in white shirts with detective badges smoked cigarettes and talked amongst each other as men carried bags from the forest and put them into vehicles. Then they were gone. I waited months to hear something, anything, nothing. I asked my parents what had happened, did they figure it out, and over time their answers would get more and more uninteresting. Eventually I quit asking and forgot about it for the most part. It faded into a memory, 
fuzzy and dreamlike, the way childhood memories are. Eventually, I came home from college and I was sitting out by the fire with an old neighborhood friend who had been there that day. He saw everything I saw. We started talking about it after a few beers and got curious about the outcome. We started researching online and couldn't find a single word of information on a skeleton discovered in our neighborhood. It was baffling. I asked my parents the next day and they said they had no idea what I was talking about. His parents said the same thing. Whatever happened that day, whatever they found, it was intentionally buried and forgotten. To this day, they all hold adamant that it never happened, but we hold adamant that it did. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the park service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy. This one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the park service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and things like that, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we would use llamas or mules to pack our gear. All the while, we would sleep in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington state. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macabre Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves, meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal, before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here for over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal was to allow guided tours to take place at some time in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the Ozette bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain wasn't difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five mile loop every day, bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we would need on our backs. These were full 10 plus hour days Usually, we started our morning hike at around 7 a.m., 
and we began our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse at around 5. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we could call the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point. The weather had turned, and we'd be lucky to see two to three people in an entire day doing the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around 4 p.m., and my co-worker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark. My rationale being that the more trips I did today, the less I would have to do tomorrow. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last boards for the day took a look around the prairie as the sun started to tuck behind the trees and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun and making visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I failed to spook easily. Having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry, I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and even ran into a few demented hillbillies over the years. As I left the prairie that evening, though, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted from my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I found myself wanting to walk faster, to jog, and then to sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself that I had been reading far too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so before I started to hear something faint. Something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here, and still at least two miles from civilization. That civilization, in reality, being likely the only other soul out there. My co-worker. Sure enough, however, I heard music, more specifically, a piano. It started out so faint, I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it. The steps on the wooden boardwalk were too loud and covered it up. Every time I paused to hear it, it became unmistakable. It got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the noises of life, no birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush, absolutely nothing other than the piano. It was as if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods, certain places have it, but this was different somehow unique to this location, unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't quite recognize the composition. Unsurprising, since I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow I felt that it was meant just for me in this moment. I started walking again, almost on cue, the music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of the music. And then, as quickly as it came, the piano stopped whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off. It didn't fade into extinction. It was just gone. Suddenly, everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. 
The gloom, the stagnation, and weight of everything was just lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life, somehow, was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, nor did I sense anything unusual. I told my coworker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another Park Service employee. I told my grandfather about what happened. He was a retired park ranger who had worked at nearby Mora just the next station over. Without the least bit of hesitation, he goes, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it or just the piano this time? This story is from when I lived off the grid in the forest of Western North Carolina. Some friends and I all lived in these small shacks, essentially a shed with a loft. They were very close together, so we all lived together in a community. Living in such primal and close conditions breeds a kind of deep, trusting friendship that you just can't get from living anywhere else. Naturally, we did almost everything together. By our little semicircle of houses, there was a railroad track. If you followed it south, it would lead to a waterfall. This waterfall, in particular, is where everybody would go to get high. It was a normal night, humid, sometime in early July. A group of about six friends and I, Laura, Andy, Nick, and some of Andy's friends that I didn't know that well but recognized, decided to walk out to this waterfall in the dark. I was the only sober one in the group, so I felt a higher sense of responsibility for everyone and was therefore on edge and hyper aware of our surroundings. Others would walk faster or slower or stop altogether in the group. So it was natural and expected that we wouldn't be able to see everyone at the same time. Andy was in rare form though, when Laura had to stop to pee, he came out of the bushes and scared her, and then ran off ahead behind the rest of the group. This pissed off both me and Laura, since it was such a clear invasion of privacy and unnecessarily spooky in the already creepy night. Laura and I eventually got to where we could see Andy again, but he was walking by himself, and then he slipped back into the bushes without even looking at us. Dismissing it as him just being affected, we kept moving forward. Still not back with the whole group yet, we realized that Andy had followed in behind us, just far enough away that we could only see his silhouette. Finally, we catch up with the rest of the group and see that all of us are accounted for, even Andy. We asked him how he got ahead of us and beat us to the group when he had last been seen at least 15 yards behind us just minutes ago. Everyone went dead silent, as Laura and I realized that whoever had scared her when she peed, and whoever had followed us after that, wasn't Andy or anyone else from the group. We never made it to the waterfall. When I was a junior in college, I went camping with four friends in Bald Eagle State Park in Pennsylvania. We had reserved a campsite that was pretty remote, pretty deep in the park, way up on one of the mountains and not near any of the other campsites. It was located at the end of a narrow dirt road, maybe about 75 feet long, which itself broke off from the main road, which was also dirt. There was nothing at the end of the little road, except for our campsite. We parked at the entrance and spent the day hiking up to the site, setting up camp, and then hiking around. We made a fire, made dinner, and then turned in. Not long afterward, we discovered that one of the guys with us snored, loudly, like walls of the tent shaking snores. Truly deafening stuff. After probably an hour or so, the rest of us gave up on trying to sleep and climbed out of our tents, 
leaving our loud friend snoring away in his. My friend at the time was a DJ for our school's radio station, and she had a late night show. I think she was on between midnight and 2 a.m. Since we couldn't sleep, we trekked up to the main road, where the reception was a little better, and where we would actually be able to hear the radio over the snoring. When we got to the road, we stood in a loose circle near the entrance to our site. As we stood there, a black pickup truck, with its lights off, appeared out of the woods and passed us, very slowly. It was unmarked, not a ranger. We listened to the radio for maybe half an hour or 45 minutes after that, and we even briefly called in to say hi. Finally, though, we decided to head back to bed. One of the girls went off into the woods to take care of some things while I climbed back into the tent I shared with her and got into my bag. After a couple of minutes, I heard her moving through the leaves toward the tent, coming from the right. At the same time, I also heard the unmistakable rumble of tires on the ground. I stood up and looked out of the little screen window on the tent. We hadn't bothered to put up the rain fly, as it was a perfectly clear night with a very bright moon, so I could see everything. I saw my friend come sprinting back to the tent and duck behind it, just as the black truck pulls into our campsite, still with its headlights off. Then, it shuts off its engine and sits there. Our friend is still snoring. I have a little knife in my tent, and I know my other two friends have at least one in theirs, but we have no other weapons, no guns, not even bear spray. So we just watch. As I said, it's a clear night, and I can see the truck just fine. It's maybe 20 feet from my tent, but I can't see who's in the truck or how many people there are. Nothing seems to move inside the truck. I still remember the metallic clunk sounds as the engine cooled off. I honestly have no idea how long I just watched it. My friend had ducked down behind our tent, and I could hear her breathing. I could hear that she was terrified, but neither of us said a word. It felt like it was a really long time. It had to be at least ten minutes that went by, but it could have been a half an hour or more. We just kept waiting for something to happen. Nothing did. Eventually, the truck starts up again, and then backs up along the narrow, dirt road. It never turned its lights on. I heard it drive back in the direction it had originally come from, and that was it. My friend burst into the tent a second later. Now we're all talking. Did you see that? Holy shit. But our friend is still asleep. Eventually, we just went to bed. We packed up and headed out in the morning just as we had planned. And yes, we checked with the park, and they don't own any black, unmarked SUVs. Nor did any ranger come to check on our site during the night. To this day, we have no idea who they were, or what they wanted. When I was working as a backpacking guide in western North Carolina, my schedule dictated a full eight-day shift with six days off. During those six days, myself and other co-workers would play in the woods. In the summer, you can't beat a mountain swimming hole. One of our favorites was called Paradise Falls, alternately called Wolf Creek Falls. This is a cliff jumping spot with a huge swimming area, a tiny slot canyon, and an inner pool. Most will venture to do the small jump into the inner pool. Even though it's the smallest jump, it's arguably the least accessible. Even though the jump is 9 feet at most, you have to work through a 10 minute rock scramble to get to the top of it. We were all venturing in, and from inside the tiny canyon, you can't see the main pool. Well, we got to the jump and coaxed the first person off a fellow guide who had never been to the spot before. She jumped successfully and swam out into the main pool and beach area beyond our eyesight, and then screamed. 
Because she was now out of sight, myself and another guy jumped in together and swam the short distance to her, with others in tow. Of course, we figured she was injured somehow. She was treading water and just staring, wide-eyed at the riverbank. When I looked to the shore, I saw what she had screamed at. There stood a man. He was massively large, easily 6'6 and a little change. He wore beat-up overalls and no shirt. There didn't appear to be a hair on him. Perhaps the most disturbing was that he had folds of skin all over his body. Imagine the Michelin man, but made of flesh. His face, his arms, his chest, everything had a uniform layer of shingled fat rolls. And he was brandishing a shotgun. The area around Wolf Creek is just holler after holler, but there are a few residences, and those few have been there for generations, propagated by the same families. These people don't like outsiders, and so they keep relations within the family. I could only surmise that this individual was the product of inbreeding over decades. He just stood there and watched as we scrambled to grab anything important and stuff it in a bag. He stood and watched as we hightailed it out of that basin and back toward the parking area and never said a word. I was backpacking through Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina with my dog. Just the two of us, and we were exploring the woods around Little Lost Cove. We were going open orienteering style, so we were not on an established trail. We'd been hiking throughout the day, following a creek, and toward the evening, I noticed my dog was acting abnormally. She was very much caught in a scent of something, and wouldn't ease up. This continued for about two hours before we made camp. That night in camp, she remained on edge and stared off into the wood line. I went about my camp business as usual, and then, at around midnight, I got this prickly feeling, like I was being watched intently. I felt the feeling ride for a little bit and I kept tinkering with the fire. And then, I heard the brush rustle. I got up from the fire and shone my flashlight up the hillside. A figure on all fours just managed to escape the beam, all but the tail. It was a tail that I knew was not supposed to exist in the southern Appalachians. I cast my light again across the hillside, and this time I caught its eyes. Two glowing yellow orbs, just watching and waiting. At that point, I went into a fury, grabbed my tomahawk, and charged up the hill after the beast, screaming and cursing all the while. The watcher ran off, but neither I or the dog slept that night. The following morning, we left camp at first light and began hiking up the mountain to the ridgeline, which would lead us out. Atop the ridgeline in the fresh mud were a series of tracks tracks left by an animal that officially no longer exists in the eastern U.S. They were catamount tracks. They commonly go by cougars in the east, but we'd been stalked by a mountain lion just the same. Those tracks ran across the ridge, revealing that it had been watching and stalking us throughout the entire previous day as we hiked through the creek bed below. They weren't bobcat tracks, I know those. They were way too big, and so were the eyes I saw. I truly believe that if my dog hadn't given me some red flags, I would have been mauled that night. It remains one of my personal scariest experiences ever, and it just goes to show that sometimes, when you feel that something's creepy and off, it can be a lot scarier than a ghost. I work for a well-known university as a field biologist and have recently been contracted out to the National Forest Service. My first assignment has been in the Potomac District of the Monongahela National Forest. Basically, I receive GPS coordinates and I either drive or hike to the designated spot and do whatever they want me to do. 
This could be setting up trail cameras or counters, monitoring equipment, doing trail surveys, and the like, and then recording the data 24 hours after placement. No big deal. I thought it odd that they specifically requested I place the cameras only three feet off the ground, and some of the infrared cameras in the trees at specified heights. Some of these locations are on designated trails, but some are way off the trail in places that humans would never go. Sometimes there isn't a hotel or lodging close enough. These are the remote mountains in West Virginia. And the Forest Service has outfitted me in some pretty dank camping gear on the occasions I might have to camp. I am an experienced hiker and camper, and have spent many nights alone out in the field due to my career choice. I'm a woman, about 5 foot 6 and 130 pounds, but I'm not really afraid of anything. Again, the Forest Service has outfitted me well, and I wear an emergency beacon that will send every law enforcement officer in the area to my location in no time. So, I've been assigned to this district for a few months now and have really enjoyed my work. West Virginia is very remote and unspoiled, and that's why I do what I do. I get to see things most people wouldn't, and I have had so many positive and almost spiritual moments up until a few nights ago. I was working up near Spruce Knob, which is the highest point in West Virginia, and a complex system of trails, wilderness areas, camping, and so on. It's also been snowing, with howling winds and ice storms. I was camping up there to complete my work, and while the conditions were rough, I was almost enjoying it. My first night in the woods was pretty peaceful. I made dinner, set up camp, and drank some whiskey. I snuggled down in my sleeping bag and slept like a rock. It was very cold, but I wear this turtle fur face mask thing and didn't feel the cold too much. I woke up at dawn and went about building my fire back up and starting some coffee when I noticed all this churned up snow around my campsite. Not tracks, just churned up snow like someone or something had kicked it all around. Weird, but whatever. I had a 15 mile hike to set some cameras and didn't really have time to wonder about it. I set off on my hike, did what I had to do, and started back to camp. I never wear earbuds or anything because hearing is one of the most important senses in the wilderness. I want to be able to hear any animals or people before I see them. It was already past dark when I made it back to camp, and I was too tired to do anything except strip down to my base layer, get into my sleeping bag, and pass out. At around 2am, I woke up because I could hear people talking. People. I was 30 miles up a gravel road that was locked with forest service gates, and around 10 miles from where my truck was parked, and I could hear voices. I completely lost my shit. I have a firearm and I quietly retrieved it from my pack and got back into my sleeping bag, cocked it, and waited. I was on high alert, all my senses going wild. Eventually the voices faded and I couldn't hear them anymore, but I never went back to sleep. At daylight I emerged from my tent to more churned up snow, and my two trail cameras hanging from a tree, about five feet from my tent. Cams I had placed 15 miles out from my campsite. I packed my shit as fast as I could and hauled ass back to my truck. Along the way, I saw a lot of human boot tracks all around my site. When I reached my truck, I discovered it had been broken into, and my computer and some other equipment had been stolen. I'm currently sitting in a luxury log cabin at some resort, too scared to retrieve my other equipment, and too embarrassed to tell my supervisors how scared I am. The Forest Service bought me a new truck while my other one is getting the window replaced, and I did make a report about the theft, but there is no way in hell I am ever going back to that site. I don't know if this means I'll be fired or sent to work at a desk, but out of all the years I've been doing this in the national forests all over the country, this is the most terrified I have ever been. 
I'm not scared of animals, and I have many stories to share about my encounters with them, but I am scared of people. It's not unusual for me to trek out on solo hiking day trips. For context, I'm a 31-year-old female. I frequently visit the nearby provincial parks in Canada that are generally well used. It's rare that I end up on a hike not at least seeing one or two people. I grew up going on camping and hiking trips, and I feel very comfortable out in nature. I always inform people where I'm going and when I'm expected to be back. Safety first, right? One day last year, I was going stir crazy. So I took myself out to a popular nature educational center. A bunch of trails stem from this one spot. They're not long trails, but they are all interconnected, so it's easy to create your own distance. It was midweek, so I wasn't expecting to encounter many people, maybe a school group at most. I grab my backpack, lock the car, and head out. It was a beautifully sunny day, mid-autumn, so it was a little chilly out. I was listening to the sounds of nature surrounding me. Some squirrels, birds, even a deer crossed my trail at one point. I was sticking with the main trail, which had educational signs identifying the different types of plants as you went along. I have been trying to teach myself how to identify different trees on site, so this path was the best. I made my way up the first little hill, and then I made my way down the path, where it takes a sharp right turn. Up ahead, I caught sight of a man wearing a dark blue jacket. Strange, I hadn't seen any signs of the person or heard them, but whatever. Normally, I'm comforted seeing somebody else on the trail, but this time my gut instinct was not happy. I made a note of which way the person went and continued along. Blue Jacket had taken the path that I wanted to take to create a longer hike. It would have been a lot more secluded and less traveled, so for once I tried to be smart, listen to my gut, and just follow the main route back to my car keep it short and safe. There would be other days for a long hike. I still had about two kilometers to get back to the parking lot. Clouds decided that they wanted to skirt across the sky, making the woods a little dull and ominous. I kept looking over my shoulder, feeling very unsettled. The trees cast finger-like shadows that did not help calm my imagination at all. One of my favorite spots on this main trail had a few huge boulders or rock formations right smack dab in the middle that you had to go around. Really neat for photos and climbing on a normal day. But today, they filled me with even more dread. I couldn't pinpoint why, at first. Until I noticed some scuffs around the base of the rocks, going the wrong way around. The trail is very obvious which way to go, left, and these marks were to the right. It was like somebody walked around the rocks dragging their foot behind them. An animal? Maybe. I couldn't figure it out. I wanted to turn around and go back the way that I'd come, but that would have added another four kilometers to get back to the car. I stuck close to the far side of the real path, keeping a close eye on the rock formation. As I made it to the other side of the rocks, I caught sight of some blue fabric, the same blue jacket that I saw earlier. The person moved as if ducking down between some rocks to avoid being seen. For blue jacket man to reach the rocks before me, he either cut his own path through the woods or sprinted through about five to six kilometers of trails. I didn't like the thought of either option as I didn't know this person, and at this point, I didn't want to know them. Maybe he was taking a leak. Yeah, I'll go with that. I picked up my pace and dug my phone out. I texted my usual hiking friend, telling her all the details in case I went missing. Yes, I attempted to do this while following the path. I only walked into one tree. I glanced behind me again while the rocks were still in sight, and I saw the man just standing there 
looking at me. I ran the rest of the way back to my car, hopped in, and immediately locked the doors. Curiously, there wasn't a single other vehicle in the parking area or on the road nearby. This place was nowhere near any towns, so I have no clue where Blue Jacket came from. I took a couple of minutes to sort myself out in the car, and as I pulled out to leave, I looked at the trailhead. There was that damn blue jacket on the signpost I had just passed to get to my car with nobody visible nearby. I was so spooked by this encounter that I refused to ever hike there alone again. Maybe it was all just an innocent misunderstanding, but it sure scared the hell out of me. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we lived. Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, Vlad the Impaler, and others. They were all once residing here and fighting battles. The region has been occupied many times. The longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover and the First and Second World Wars had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here. The so-called Vlak magic, or Vlaska magia, in Valation, is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorites was a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest, in a small and old house that was about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather, who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars, and even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if it was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home, and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits the house and stays overnight here. This place creeps me out. Even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be here. I can't imagine staying here overnight, but he frequently does, and one day he told me a very weird story. While he stays there, he gets visited often. At first, I thought visits like the one you get from neighbors or something. But he told me that one night he woke up to a hand crawling on his head. It was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him, using his hand to just crawl across his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we used to speak here, a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair, and the hand felt very soft, my grandfather always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time he told me that he used to fix small parts around his house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave with his tractor because it takes about an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him, until a plank was thrown down the stairs. 
He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around, locked the barn, and didn't so much as frown. They expect you to react. Do not give them this pleasure, is what he told me while laughing. It makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really runs in our family, experiencing from time to time such encounters. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual stories from the past, how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark, and what he experienced while doing so. Since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motorcycle and drove out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about things, you know? To be in this type of state that you don't have to question everything and think about the world. So one day I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I find myself driving to the old house he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. I live, as mentioned, in East Serbia, where vampires are very widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dusk, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought that I was invincible. In fact, even a vampire wouldn't cross my path, that I would ease past with him to no harm. There aren't really any streets there. It's just a dirt road between trees that leads to pretty much nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road starts to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. I thought maybe it was a bug that I had squished it, but it was just too much blood. So I started to look at my hand for wounds, but my hand seemed to be perfectly fine. My heart slowly started racing, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my entire life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It seemed like somebody was sitting behind me, just waiting for me to fall down or make a mistake. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. I have a ton of stories regarding these kinds of events. Also, we have a few witches in our family that used to practice black magic. It was taught to them by their ancestors. It was 2009 in my summer holidays when I was eight years old. As usual, for many years, my family and I went to Cordoba, Argentina and rented a cabin. Strange things often happened in that cabin, like moving objects strange noises, or even things that just outright disappeared. One night, I was sleeping when suddenly I got up in the middle of the night. When I looked in front of me, an old, careless, and creepy woman was looking at me. She didn't say a word, so I just closed my eyes, and when I opened them, she was gone. I ran into my father's bedroom and told my parents, but of course they didn't believe me. About two years ago, we went to those cabins again. One day I started talking with the owner, and he was telling me about some strange noises that he had heard that night. Surprised, I told him about the creepy vision I had. He just casually looks at me and says, You're not the first one that that happens to. Many people have reported visions of an old woman or a girl who stares at them in the night. Back in October of 1989, 
My mother and I went up to the western part of North Carolina for a week to see the leaves change color. We rented a cabin which was owned by the cousin of my brother's former high school band teacher who had retired several years earlier. The band director was more or less keeping watch over the place. He lived down the street, but it wasn't until Friday afternoon that we saw him. The cabin was somewhat in the wilderness, but it was near a main road. The band director had to go away for the weekend and was letting us know. We had the number of his cousin in case we needed any help. This was on a Friday afternoon. Up until that time, the trip had been uneventful. Friday evening, we went to a church dinner, which was down the road. When we came back home, it was already dark. My mom started thinking about how we were the only ones on this road, and we didn't know where the nearest neighbor was, which was a little unsettling. The moon wasn't full, but there was a light to the moon. We had separate rooms in the cabin. The power went out in the cabin shortly after we came home from the church dinner. Then... My mother heard what sounded like footsteps, and she saw what looked like the outline of a hat. There was a man walking around near the cabin. Then we saw this hat disappear into the woods. By this time, both of us are terrified that this man is going to come into the cabin and harm us. Both of us wondered aloud if he had cut the power source. I decided to sleep in the bed which was in my mother's room. We tried to sleep, but then we were awakened by an owl howling. My mother could see the owl's eyes which were looking into the window. The drape couldn't be closed the entire way. That owl didn't take its eyes off my mom the entire night, and it hooted all night long. My mother tried to ignore the owl, but its presence really unnerved her, and its eyes really unnerved me. Neither one of us could sleep as every noise jarred us. It would be like, what's that? What noise is that? Every once in a while, we would see the outline of the hat walking around the general area, and then it would go off into the woods. Both of us were freaked out at this point, but we weren't about to leave in the middle of the night. There was no phone in the cabin, and this was long before cell phones were in common use. The power finally did come back on several hours later, or so it seemed. We were in the wee hours of the morning. Originally, we were going to leave on Sunday, but as soon as the sun came up on Saturday, we left. We laugh about it now, but neither of us know what kept us up all night. It was a memorable night. I had an extremely strange encounter that I just had to put into words to see if anybody can make anything out of it. I was with my niece, who is on her high school soccer team and is taking it pretty seriously. She's attempting to get some kind of scholarship out of it. I am pretty healthy and don't really work out too much, but something I often do is run and hike. I live in Kentucky. Not in a rural part, but there's a state park near my house that's 6,500 acres, so it is pretty secluded and densely wooded. There are some really nice trails that allow you to run for a good chunk and then hike for a bit to split up the long bits of trail that are flat. She decided to tag along with me today for a quick three to four mile run. It was raining, but nothing too heavy. Kind of a spitting rain, nothing we can't handle. We got up to the peak of this one hill, and it had been about two miles or so, according to our phones, so we decided to turn back and head back to the car. As we were headed down the steep side of the climb, we were walking pretty slowly, making sure that we didn't lose our footing. Out of nowhere, there was the coldest chill that came from behind us once we made it about halfway down. At the time that it happened, we both commented on how cold it was on our backs, but we didn't make too much out of it and went on with our conversation. In these woods, there's some wildlife, like small deer and I believe maybe some coyotes, but they tend to stay away from the paths. At least, I have only ever heard them in many years of coming here, but never once seen them. 
the only thing that I've ever seen of them is a few tracks. Once we got off the hillside and hit a stretch of trail that was flatter ground, we began to pick up the pace when a deer darted across the path, maybe 10 yards maximum in front of us, causing us to stop in our tracks. The first deer was then followed by three more, and not one of them even so much as looked our way. My niece looked at me puzzled because of the oddity of this behavior. To me, they were acting like they were running from something like a predator of some sort. Once they had gone, we started back with our run, and we heard a noise behind us. A loud, booming noise of something of substance falling to the ground from some height. When we stopped and turned, we saw nothing. No animals scurrying away like one would expect after such a substantial noise in the wilderness. In fact, everything was calm, eerily calm. Just as we looked to each other to ask what was going on, there was yet another cold wind gush through the valley, pushing all the rain off the leaves surrounding us and soaking our sweatshirts. I was starting to freak out inside, but was doing my best to stay calm for my 17-year-old niece, but I'm pretty sure she could tell that I was really freaking out. I said, come on, let's get to the car, and we turned to take off again, and there was a man leaned up against a tree on the side of the trail, dressed in a black suit, with a white button-up shirt on. His collar was opened, but he had a tie on, sagging like a tired businessman on the way home from a long day. It startled me at first. I was not expecting to see anybody for a few reasons. One being we were, at the very least, one mile away from any parking lot or street. Another being that we never heard or saw him coming and the stretch of trail we were on was flat and open for a good half of a mile. I got over to put myself between the man and my niece as we jogged past him. When we did, I looked him in the eye and gave him a how you doing nod as we went along. He was sort of pale, his eyes were very white, but his irises were ice blue. Everything that I saw from the quick look I got up close looked to be clean cut and proper. I didn't notice a single speck of mud on him anywhere, and the two of us had it caked on the bottom of our shoes and even the backs of our pants and shirts from kicking it up on us as we ran. We had to get to the top of another hill, smaller than the last, but still quite the hike up. Once on top, I took a quick look behind us, and he seemed to have vanished without a trace. Now with having the vantage point of the hill, I could see out past the trail and see most of the hill that she and I had just come from, yet he was nowhere in sight. I scanned off the sides of the trail and still nothing. My niece asked me who that guy was and why he was out so deep in the woods wearing a suit, questions I simply didn't have the answers to. We made it back to the car with nothing else out of the ordinary happening to us on the trail. As we came to my car, I pulled the keys from my pocket and unlocked the doors from maybe 10 feet out. Walking up to the only car in the entire lot, I noticed muddy footprints coming away from the car door from the driver's side. Weird, considering I had no mud on my shoes when we got there, but there are trails leading up to the lot, so I figured maybe somebody came through before we got there and I didn't notice. However, when I pulled the handle to open the door, it was caked with mud underneath, almost like somebody was attempting to open my door with a muddy hand. Nothing more happened, but the entire encounter leaves chills all over my body the more I think about it. My mother and father divorced when I was eight. I lived with my father until late 1995. I was 13 when I moved in with my mother. But in 2002, I had a falling out with my stepfather and ended up moving back in with my father. My father lived in the country, while my mother lived in a small town. My father's home was surrounded by forests with few neighbors, situated on a hill. When I was a child, I used to walk through the woods, so I knew them really well. In 2004, my father's home burned to the ground, and we left the area. 
moving into a small town and living in an apartment. I ended up in college, studying film, and I was tasked with making a film. I decided to shoot a short film about a serial killer stalking campers in the woods, because I was really unoriginal at the time. So me and my two friends, Adam and Zach, were looking for locations. I figured the forest where I used to live would be perfect, because it was in the middle of nowhere, and there would be no sounds. So we did what you would normally do, scout locations. One for the campsite and routes the protagonist and antagonist would take through the forest. We arrived and were deep in the woods. At this time, only one person still lived in the area and he wasn't home. Nor did he own all the land, so we stayed well clear of his property. As we were moving through the forest, trying to find the perfect clearing, all was quiet, which was startling because although we were in the deep woods, the sounds of birds and bugs were kind of a normal thing. It was in the afternoon, so there wasn't really any reason for the forest to be so silent. We came across a clearing I knew, but it was different somehow. When I was a child, deep in the forest, there was an old wooden structure, flat, that we called the stage because, well, it looked like a stage. It was in a clearing, right next to a tree line, with a wide field that could fit hundreds of people there for a concert. Whether that's what it was, or it was something as simple as the floor of an old shack, I don't know. All I know was that when I had gotten there, there was a camper, and someone built a pond right in the middle of the clearing. We decided that somebody was clearly using the space, so it would be best to find a different spot. We went to the tree line and descended down a steep hill to a creek. All the while we were talking to ourselves about how the silence was so weird. If you live in or around a forest, you hear wildlife all the time. The lack of it in such a dense area was strange. We crossed the creek and made our way through fallen trees and rocks until we found ourselves in a very wooded area. Adam had noticed first and pointed to a grouping of trees that made a perfect circle. Under the dead leaves lay stones, arranged in a circle, and in the center was broken bottles. I walked over to it and ended up tripping. I braced myself with my forearm and deeply cut it with a broken bottle. As I stood up, the silence was broken by a loud scream. It sounded human, female but it was a scream. And no, it was not a mountain lion or anything else. I know what the wildlife sounds like there, and it was nothing like that. This was a human woman screaming in the middle of the deep woods. I turned to where I thought it had come from, and beyond the trees, in the brush, I saw something red run off. We decided to head back. As we came back to the stage and pond area, a truck pulled up. The guy that was the only person living in the area ordered us into his truck to take us out of the area. He said that he owned that area and that he knew we were trespassing. He knew me, so he didn't give me a hard time or threaten me. He dropped us off and I asked him how he knew we were there. He said, I didn't. I just heard some scream and thought some idiot fell in the pond. I ended up with stitches in my arm after going to the ER. I have only two explanations that might be plausible. The first is that we didn't know what was beyond the brush. It could have been a home, and maybe kids were playing. While the scream was loud and I saw something red running, we could have just startled someone. But the problem with that theory is that the guy who came in the truck heard it too, and we were far enough away from where he lived to where he would have had a hard time hearing it. The only other possible explanation I could think of is that the scream came from behind us, and because of the trees and acoustics, echoing made me think that it was coming from in front of us. This might account for how the guy had heard it too. His home is halfway to the stage area, which is why he was able to get there so fast. But that doesn't account for the red thing I saw, or what the scream was in the first place. I can almost explain it, except that I still can't.
Last year, I had a very strange experience in a national forest out in California. I was by myself on a road trip with my dog, and I was driving pretty far into Mendocino National Forest. I like to camp in national parks and forests because it's isolated, so my dog can roam and they're free of charge. A trade-off for sketchy and rough drives into the parks sometimes, and the lack of service and assistance. Anyway, I was driving up this dirt road kind of curling up a mountain, maybe around 5 p.m. It was really nice out, sunny and warm with a slight breeze. Nothing serious happened, but I felt extremely uncomfortable driving into the area, and that feeling did not let up. Driving up the mountain, I felt like I shouldn't stay there and I even texted my boyfriend about it for as long as I could before my phone completely lost service. I was looking for a sign of another person having been around the area lately, but I didn't see anything. I pulled over and got out of my car with my dog to look over the edge, and I noticed a dead squirrel and some broken glass mixed in with the dirt and gravel road. Yucca, my dog, started to growl slightly. She's vocal, but I've almost only ever seen or heard her growl at or with other dogs. I did see her growl at a possum once, so it could be something she smelled, maybe. This place continued to make me feel quite on edge, but I pride myself in being an independent traveler and backpacker, so I decided to continue at least a bit further with my grumbling pup to see if I could find a good place to camp. I continued to notice more dead animals. Keep in mind, no one is going to be going more than 5 to 10 miles per hour up this thing, and that's if there's anyone even there. I hear men's voices. They sound close, and I think I should call out to them. So I stop my car, but then I kind of freeze up, and I feel like I shouldn't. I can't really make out what they're saying. I don't see any sign of people anywhere. And I get back in my car and continue to slowly drive forward, and cautiously look for where the voices could be coming from. I've never run into other people in a national park or forest when I've gone this deep in. The unsettling feeling grows about the voices, which have sort of come and gone a few times, and I give up and begin to turn my car around. I honestly don't remember how Yucca was acting on the way down. I was scared and just focused on getting out of there. I just distinctly remember being surprised at her grumbling when we were standing outside of my car. Kind of dangerously quickly, I went back down the mountain, not seeing any sign of anyone. I decided to spring for luxury and get a hotel for the night. I figured I was just fine. Huge and open spaces can be intimidating, I told myself. And the voices could have been echoing from somewhere far off, and they just sounded close. Animals die. Glass gets broken. Nothing happened. Cool. But I remember this place. It sticks with me. Whenever I'm watching scary movies, if I'm walking my dog in the woods at night, nothing compares to the feeling that I had driving up that mountain. And it's honestly kind of interesting to me, as well as frightening. I recently happened upon some information, as well as some Native American lore, that made me feel extremely uneasy. Fast forward a year, I've mentioned this place to a few people and the haunting vibes that it gave me, but not much more. I googled the national park once and didn't see anything, but I didn't look too much either. I like scary movies and things of that nature, hence my fascination with this little event. So my boyfriend and I were coming up on finishing up our road trip just yesterday. We were in Wyoming for a wedding. There were only two to three hours left, and the sun had set, so we decided to listen to some scary podcasts and YouTube videos. We went from the No Sleep podcast to the X-Files and ended up on a True Stories video dealing with Native American lore. I'm half paying attention, petting my dog, playing Pokemon on an emulator, and I hear the narrator mention Wendigos, very briefly says what they are and casually mentions that they can mimic voices. 
I mean it when I say that the most horrible chills I have ever had in my life crawled down my spine when I heard that. I stared at my boyfriend and asked him if he remembered that national forest I was freaked out about last year. He says he does, and he reminds me that he texted me I was probably close to a Wendigo. He did. I do remember him saying that, but I didn't know much about their lore and I thought he was just being funny. Like, yeah, Bigfoot's probably stalking you, or some other dad joke. And he was like, no, I mean I was mostly joking, sure. But I said it specifically because you said you were hearing voices that you couldn't find a trace of. I feel super strange, and I start googling wendigos and skinwalkers, things like that. They are allegedly able to mimic human voices, and they would live in that sort of area. It all matched up. Obviously, there are a ton of questionable pieces of information out there, but I tried to find more reputable sources and websites and authentic experiences. I then specifically looked up missing persons in the area, and the first headline that catches my eye is, Another Family Goes Missing in Mendocino. I went through different websites and news articles of people going missing, but they're all hidden underneath national park websites and pictures of trees. I remembered looking up the forest about a year ago and I didn't see anything, until I realized these stories didn't really seem to be talked about that much, which also piqued my intuition and interest. It was stated that well over 100 people in the past 8 years have gone missing and not been found, on top of many who are found dead. It just has my interest piqued, remembering how unsafe I felt and how much I wanted to get out of there terrifies me. And I felt so uneasy about what I was hearing, and I do to this day. My dog and I are very close. She was a stray that started following me one day, and I ended up bringing her home from Costa Rica. So her little growls along the way made me feel like there was something wrong. Even if it was just a storytelling video, the stories have to originate from somewhere, right? I've done a lot of solo traveling both in and outside of the country, and I've never had a feeling as bad as that one. On top of seeing an unnecessary amount of dead animals in a national forest, which just seemed strange. I don't know if I'll be doing more solo traveling unless it's a little closer to civilization. I just can't stop thinking about what would have happened if I had ignored my intuition that day. I grew up in the Arctic. In the town I lived in, as long as it was a clear night, it was an extremely normal occurrence to see all sorts of strange lights move across the sky. Keep in mind, the winter is long in the Arctic, which means longer amounts of time being spent under the stars. It's quite beautiful, as long as you don't mind the cold so much. Sometimes I would drive a snowmobile a few kilometers out of town shut it down, and just lay down on the snow, looking up at the majesty of it all. The only thing disturbing the silence would be the occasional breeze. The northern lights are also a common occurrence. Doesn't happen every day, but often enough that they start getting ignored after a while, as long as they aren't too spectacular anyway. On one particular night, without asking my parents, and it was their snowmobile, I decided to go on one of my midnight drives out of town. I drove a few kilometers over the hills to find a spot devoid of light pollution from town, shut off the machine, and settled into a good spot to look up and be introspective. It wasn't all that interesting a scene, a few satellites passing here and there, some relatively boring activity affecting the magnetic field and things like that and then I started noticing a clicking noise. At first I thought it was just the sound of the snow machine cooling down, as the engine expands and contracts a lot in the cold. But the source of the sound definitely wasn't coming from that direction. My next thought was that there must be an animal nearby, in which case I needed to get out of there fast. You really don't want to mess with a wild animal out there. But the clicking is far too regular for an animal to produce it. It was a fairly mechanical sound. Again, the source of the sound isn't coming from anywhere around me laterally. 
it was coming from above me. So naturally, I look up, determined to ascertain the origin of this strange noise. I see what I always see. Stars, northern lights, a lazy satellite crossing the sky. All normal stuff. But before I dismiss it altogether and begin heading home, I notice something strange in the Aurora Borealis. There were three rather strong points of light. I ignored them at first, thinking they were oddly symmetrical stars, but this proved false. They were definitely getting brighter. I kept staring in morbid fascination as they grew stronger and stronger, yet still only remaining single points in the sky. All the while, the clicking noise is getting louder and louder and more pronounced, almost like somebody started with tapping a pen on a desk to clacking billiard balls together inside my head. And then it stops. The lights are gone. The clicking disappears. And aside from being a little stiff and cold and rather petrified, I'm fine. So I jump back on the snowmobile thinking maybe I'm going crazy. The machine takes a little longer than usual to start up, and I'm beginning to worry. But soon it's running and I'm heading back to town. As I'm driving back, several plausible scenarios as to what just occurred are running through my head. I'm thinking that it could have been a helicopter from the mine, or some strange northern lights behavior. Probably not that big of a deal. I pull up to my house. The lights are all dark. Strange. It wasn't that late when I left. I open the outer door as quietly as possible, remove my winter gear, and enter the inner door. The house is quiet. Really quiet. My parents are teachers and are usually up late, marking or watching TV. All I'm thinking is I have to get to bed without anybody noticing. Proves to be pretty easy, and soon I'm under my covers. I go to set my alarm for the next day. And all of a sudden, everything makes sense. The engine being hard to start. Being stiff. Being colder than I thought I should be. Nobody being up when I was gone what felt like a relatively short period of time. It was almost 11 p.m. when I left. But now, it was creeping up on 6 a.m. I stood, staring at clicking lights, for nearly seven hours. I never did end up sleeping that night, and I don't go on late snow machine rides anymore. Hiking alone always used to be a great way for me to clear my head, have some time alone, and get a workout in as well. After what happened this morning, I doubt I'll ever hike alone again. It was around 6 a.m., and I was surprised that it was as light as it was, so I decided to go earlier than I had originally planned. I have hiked this trail many times because it's so close to the area that I live in, Colorado Rocky Mountains, for anyone looking to identify region-specific creatures. I've hiked it both alone and with a group of people. I have never had an experience in this canyon, though I have heard that it is haunted, as many Native Americans are rumored to be buried all along the canyon, which is peppered with many hiking trails and a beautiful drive. I set off on my hike, and nothing was out of the ordinary. There were only two people I encountered. A woman who was running down the trail, and a man who was bird watching. I got past the main flat part of the trail where there was a big clearing and I could see about a hundred feet in every direction and into the more heavily wooded area with a steep hill to my left and a creek to my right. Around this time is when I started hearing someone shouting. It sounded very far off and I couldn't distinguish any words. I figured maybe someone was calling for their dog or for someone else in their party. It came and went intermittently, as if it was on the wind. But I did notice that the voice was saying the same thing over and over again, 
in a strange intonation that sounded almost sing-song. I was not afraid at this time, with it being light out and having seen other people on the trail. I stopped to take a couple of pictures right off the main trail. The light was gorgeous and hitting the water and greenery beautifully, and then I began walking again. Maybe five minutes later is when I heard it. The same voice I had heard earlier, except this time it sounded as if it was directly above me on the slope. I instantly felt a chill and began looking around for the source of the noise, but I couldn't see anyone. It was close enough that even through the summer foliage, I should have been able to see the person, if it was a person. I still couldn't make out what the voice was saying, but it was a two-syllable word. At this point, I wondered if it was some psycho looking for a young female hiker to murder, as that's often something I worry about when I hike alone. I bolted back down the way I came, practically running down the trail. I heard a crash behind me, as if something heavy landed on tree branches and cracked them. I've spent most of my life in and around forest animals. I know what deer and smaller creatures sound like, and this sounded much bigger and much clumsier, like what people sound like when they go through the undergrowth. Again, I was still thinking that I was going to have an untimely demise on my morning hike from some serial killer. So I picked up my pace, hoping to outrun whoever now seemed to be chasing me. Luckily, I didn't see anyone chasing after me, and the voice seemed to stay in the same location. It may have just been the panic of the situation, but I could have sworn that the voice changed its unintelligible word to my name as I ran away from it, which is just one syllable, and just drew it out long with the same intonation. It was odd, as if it was just going, K, K. It was at this moment that I realized that I might not be dealing with a psycho at all, but something paranormal because nobody out there should have known my name. After I reached the main flat area of the trail, the voice disappeared completely. I made it to my car in about 15 minutes. I hadn't gotten very far on my hike, and I drove up the road. The road runs parallel to the trail for almost a mile across the creek, so I was hoping to see if I could see anyone from a slightly higher perspective. I didn't, and I drove to a different location to finish my hike somewhere a lot more populated, which in hindsight also wasn't a smart move because that trail is also rumored to be haunted. Nothing else strange happened, though I was still shaken up and trying to convince myself that it was just someone calling for their dog. Now I have some theories, because as I said, the entire canyon is rumored to be haunted. It may have been a ghost of some sort, but because of the Native Americans that inhabited the area for a long time, I wondered if maybe it was a wendigo. From my scant knowledge, I know that they can imitate human voices, and sometimes they can know your name. I'm a little freaked out, especially because this haunted canyon is only a few miles from my house. If anybody knows what I encountered, would you let me know? I live in Florida and have always been aware of many Native American cultures, even though I'm not of that heritage myself. I'm not sure if this is pertinent or not, but I thought I would throw it out there. I timelined and I tried to write down everything I can remember about my experiences to give me a guide when writing this. It started from when I was very young and the first instance of this happening was when I was living with my grandmother. She and I were very close, which will play in later. I was wide awake in bed, unable to sleep, with her to my right. 
There's no doubt in my mind that she was deeply asleep only inches from me. Every television in the house was off, and the only other person in the house was my grandfather, who was asleep in his room. Then, very clearly and loudly, I heard my grandma call me from the kitchen, almost how you'd be called for dinner. I know it's common to hear your name being called mistakenly, but I did more research on this as a teenager, and apparently, when you hear your name being called this loud, you're supposed to reject it. I did not. Not knowing this, I just huddled closer to my grandmother and kept my eyes locked on the open door. The second instance was around 13 or 14, when my father took me on a family trip to Las Vegas. We visited some parts of the Grand Canyon, and while my family was waiting in line for a skywalk bridge we had paid for a tour of, I wandered around the edge, a good distance away from my family. I decided to yell my name into the canyon to hear my echo. When it came back to me, it sounded distorted and almost like my grandmother had yelled my name back. It might not have been my grandmother exactly, but it sounded very similar. Nonetheless, just the fact that it was distorted was enough to scare me a little. I don't put much weight into this experience because it might have just been my voice being thrown back at me in a weird way, but it was still odd. This next one happened when I was 13 or 14 as well. It's the most terrifying one I have had, and every time I tell this story to people, I start to tear up a little. This is the closest I've ever been to whatever this thing is, and proves my point that it's mimicking people I care about. I was on a vacation with my family in Key West. We had rented a home. I invited my best friend, who we'll call Ash, to stay with us. On the third day, we had decided to skip out on the boating trip and mooch off the homeowner's Netflix all day. On about the fifth episode of whatever we were watching, we decided on a snack refill and bathroom break. We pause the television and I make my way to the kitchen. I believed that Ash had followed me into the kitchen and leaned on the island while I prepared some chips with my back turned to her. I held a full conversation with her. I even looked back at her and she was on her phone. I fully had no doubt in my mind that I was talking to and looking at Ash. I turned my back for a split second just to pick up the bowls and suggest that we head back to the couch when I see the real Ash walk out of the bathroom, which was a solid 30 feet away. My body immediately went cold and the first thing I asked her was how she got into the bathroom and in and out without me hearing. She then gave me the weirdest look and told me that she'd been in there the whole time, ever since we got up. This is where I start freaking out and insisting that I had just been talking with her and even physically saw her. She joked about doppelgangers and about how maybe she was going to die. I quickly suggested we get out of the house and walk around the neighborhood. We walked around until my mom called me to say that she was back in the house. We are still best friends to this day and have been for 11 years. I asked her about it today before I wrote this. She said that she never heard me talking to anybody at all. Now, at this point, you guys must think I'm crazy. But for this next one, I have a witness. Again, I was on vacation near the Great Smoky Mountains, but just a little west in Sevierville, Tennessee. We had our previous reservations cancelled, so we took this little run-down cabin owned by a local woman. Now we got there late at night, and the moment we all stepped out of the car, the first thing we heard was a man's voice saying, Hey neighbors! coming from a cabin to the left of ours that was higher up on the mountain than we were. We couldn't see the cabin, really, just a road that led further up, so we assumed that he could see us, but we couldn't see him. Probably some guy on a balcony. My friendly stepdad yelled a, Hey! And we waved up toward the direction it came from. 
It wouldn't have been weird if this didn't happen every time we stepped out of the cabin or car. My family completely wrote it off as some type of hospitality we weren't used to in Miami. Retelling it, my brother and my friends agreed it was weird. I did hear constant footsteps around the cabin at night, and some outside my window. It was a raised cabin, probably a story or two off the ground. But I didn't give it much thought, since wildlife is a thing in the woods. I just thought I should mention it, maybe. The thing that really propelled me into researching what the hell was happening to me was when I was having a photo shoot in the woods behind the cabin. Both my brother, sister, and I heard something calling my name deeper into the woods. Since I was with my younger siblings, I went into full big sister protection mode and almost threw them back down the little slope that we had to climb to get up into the woods. We were all shitting bricks from how clear it was and how we all pinpointed that it was coming from deeper in the woods and nowhere near the cabin. This was during the day, and we were all so thrown by this that we stayed in for the rest of our trip. We all agreed it was a woman's voice, and the first thing I asked my mom when we got inside was, Did you call me? She had been lounging in her room with my stepdad all day, trusting that I could take care of the younger ones just outside the cabin. She saw how freaked out the kids were, and we really didn't go out at night for the rest of our trip. I think I reacted badly to this one, mostly because I had kids to take care of, and I could tell that they were terrified out there. Again, the voice sounded like someone was looking for me, or calling me back somewhere. With no knowledge of what this could be, I had finally decided to look into things and figure out why something keeps calling me into the woods. I started my search when I turned 17. I had no previous knowledge of wendigos or skinwalkers or anything cryptid-like. Only shitty ghost investigations and Zack Baggins making something out of a scratchy EVP. I'm desperate for answers because at this point I'm constantly thinking about it and driving myself into rabbit holes of information and myths and legends. Please let me know what you think it could be. I want to know who's calling me into the woods. Or what. And more importantly, why? I'm a 17-year-old guy currently living in Phoenix, Arizona. This incident took place around six months ago on an overnight trip into the Superstition Mountains, which are about an hour drive east of Phoenix. I'm not going to specify the exact trail, because I've been doing this stuff long enough to realize what happens when you post stuff on the internet. Whether it's a good trail, abandoned mine, ghosts, or whatever it may be, people come flocking, and usually with a lot of trash and loud music. Anyway, this particular trail I was taking was an 8 mile loop through a canyon. Pretty simple in and out overnight trip. I had planned to go with my friend, but a last minute cancel on his part left me on my own. So with a packed bag and a car ready to go, I decided to go on my own. Not, not leaving the house on time and some trouble navigating rough forest roads, I didn't arrive to the trailhead until around 5.45 PM, which for those of you who don't backpack is a very big no-no. I had about a four mile hike until I arrived at my planned camping spot, and it was getting dark fast. So I figured if I moved quickly enough, I could at least get two or three miles in before I had to find a spot. This strategy left me hiking a very dark trail on my own with about 15 miles of dirt road between me and anyone else. Hiking in the dark by itself is scary, especially for where I was and being on my own. Eventually, it got so dark that I could only see where my headlamp was pointing, and that's when I figured I needed to stop and set up camp, with only my headlamp as a light source. I was trying to move fast, and I ended up in a less than ideal spot, but there were some burnt pieces of wood and the remains of a fire circle, so it looked like people had been there before, but definitely not recently. I figured that meant it was at least habitable. 
My first priority was to get a fire going. I scanned the area around me and was able to find some dry wood and got it going. I got my tarp set up and cracked open a can of chili mac I'd brought for myself and was very much looking forward to eating. I was feeling good. My camp was set up and my food was on the fire. The feeling of uneasiness from the hike in had almost gone away, but it was still there a little bit. Side effect of camping alone in remote areas. To fully understand what happened, I would have to explain to you how my camp was set up. The site that I had chosen was a small clearing surrounded by large pine trees, with the trail about 30 feet to my left. When you're in the woods and have a fire going, the fire casts a circle of light around it, and everything on the edge of that circle and past it are pitch black. I was sitting on the ground near my fire, eating my dinner, when a small rock about the size of a marble was thrown into my camp. I looked at the tiny rock in shock as I was positive that I was the only person on this trail that night. I immediately turned my light on and toward the area where I had seen the rock come from, but due to the density of the pines and brush I could only see about 10 feet. I spent the next 15 minutes in complete disbelief as I scanned the tree line that surrounded me, searching for what or whoever had thrown the rock, not daring to stray far from my fire that, in hindsight, offered me a false sense of security. After sitting back down and spending the rest of my time on high alert, I was able to convince myself that I had somehow kicked the rock or it had fallen from a tree. I went to sleep that night not expecting the pure terror that was about to unfold. I woke to the sound of rustling leaves, barely audible if you weren't listening for them, but they were there. Still in a sleepy daze, I listened as the rustling of leaves got harder to hear, and I assumed that whatever it was, they were moving away from me. I went to grab my handheld flashlight that I had left next to me when I fell asleep. But the more I looked, the more scared I got, as I came to realize that it was no longer there. I stood up in my sleeping bag and ducked out of my tarp to look around. Off in the woods, I was able to see a light, about 15 feet away. My light. It was my flashlight, laying on the ground on a pile of leaves. This is one of the few moments in my life where I almost shit my pants. The flashlight that I had left sitting right next to me when I had fallen asleep a few hours ago was now 15 feet away from me, past the tree line in the woods. I hurriedly slipped my boots on, clutching my knife in my other hand and keeping my head on a swivel. I weighed my options, stay here and wait out the night, or attempt the three mile hike back to the car in the dark. I figured that whatever or whoever was out here with me was definitely going to have a better advantage if I was out on the trail without a light. So I decided to stay at the camp and wait out the night. Eventually, it came back. I could hear it walking through the woods. It was far off, but it was there. It sounded like someone leisurely walking by, like they were on a stroll without a care in the world. Sometimes it would walk too far away, and I would lose the sound of its steps. But then, an hour later, maybe two, it would return, still as faint as ever. This went on for about three to four hours until I listened to the steps get closer and closer, until they were about seven feet away from me. At this point, the fire had gotten very small as I had run out of wood on my pile. The footsteps stopped, and everything went totally silent. I sat there still for two hours, clutching a knife in my hand and praying that I wouldn't hear anything else. I stayed like that until the sun cast enough light that I could see I was alone in my campsite. I packed my things and speed walked the three miles back down the trail I had taken. I arrived at the empty dirt road where my car was parked 
and nearly sprinted to it as I unlocked the Subaru, jumped in, and drove. I didn't stop until I had put at least 20 miles between me and that place. I stopped at a gas station in Apache Junction to buy a Red Bull, but mostly just to see and talk to another human being. As I exited the store, I was able to read something that was written in the dust on the back window of my car. Sleep well? A lot of weird things have happened to me on my various adventures through Arizona, but this is the weirdest and scariest by far, so I thought I'd share it. There is a seriously deranged person, or something, living in the Superstition Mountains. There's a reason that rumors surround that place. Do yourself a favor, and stay as far away from those mountains as you can.